Good morning. Uh, my name is Dan Ambre. My company is Full Spectrum Diagnostics. I'm here on behalf of Grace Engineered Products. Uh, we're going to do a three-part uh, webinar uh, today, Thursday, and next Tuesday, uh, discussing the basics of vibration analysis. Uh, a little bit about my company out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, uh, we do we have a vibration analysis training division. Uh, our uh, training is aligned with guidelines put in place by uh, the American Society of Non-Destructive Testing, or ASMT, and the ISO, International Organization for Standardization. Um, everything we do in the field goes into our training materials. So most of our instructors spend at least 50% of their time in the field getting hands-on uh, experience and understanding how real systems work. Uh, we also have live certification training um, and interactive training, uh, and that's becoming more popular with all the uh, virus problems. There's webinars going on like crazy now. Uh, we're part of that. So if you like what you see, uh, there's plenty on the website uh, that I'll be showing you uh, at the end of the presentation, and you can come find me. I'd be most appreciative. Uh, we also have a, a machinery analysis division. Uh, our specialty is experimental modal analysis and operating deflection shape analysis. But basically what it boils down to is the animation type uh, format we have on the right here. Uh, this is the animation of one of the problems in the machine. This was a refinery pump uh, in Wyoming. Um, and you can look at it and you can say that it doesn't look right. It looks like it's out of phase with the motor and something scooped up in the coupling. Everybody sees it right away in an animation. I've spent years uh, talking about vibration. I can put a room to sleep immediately. But if I have uh, an animation, I throw it up like this. Everybody can see what the problem is. Everybody has a, a part in the solution. So I have a little corny saying down here at the bottom, but it's true. Uh, our process is making vibration analysis visible and workable throughout the customer's management chain such that they can be involved in their own asset management solutions. And everybody gets involved when they uh, see an animation. Uh, we also have a, a imaging division. Uh, we use Emmyscope ODS videos. Basically, it's a high-speed video vibration analysis. Uh, we take uh, high-speed clips, we put them through something called an optical flow algorithm, which enhances uh, the displacements, rescales the amplitudes, and it allows us to see what the human eye can't perceive uh, in, any, in any video animation, either because it's uh, the event's too fast or the displacements are too small, or both. So here you can see there's some type of problem in the machine. It's moving awkwardly. Uh, what it turned out to be and I'll give you a short version of this, is there was a problem in this foot of the motor, of the structure under the foot. This base plate was lamp, uh, grouted in, a uh, big C-channel or I-beam channel around the outsides. They pump grout in. Uh, it delaminated uh, from the base plate, so it was lifting. So you get this kind of uh, diagonal vibration going in there and put a little color on it. This should be all gray down here. There shouldn't be any... Um, any color to it at all that just tells you that there's some motion there. So the only way we found this was with a vibration video, which was uh, very interesting. Okay, this uh, part one, introduction to vibration analysis, uh, we're going to have first a high level overview of the predictive maintenance process. Now this uh, is going to be recorded and you can uh, get a copy of the recording. You can watch it as many times as you want. I, instead of sitting there and making notes or anything like that, I would suggest you just sit and absorb it, okay? I might have to talk a little fast. If you're writing things down, you're, you're going to miss some things. So just sit, sit back and, and uh, uh, have fun. Um, so it's a high-level process we're going to look at first. We're going to look at the measurement to analysis cycle all the way through, and that's the core of vibration analysis. We're going to look at the vibration fault periodic table, and that was the first table that was on the screen you saw before. Uh, this is structure and method. This allows the vibration analyst to think logically about which faults apply and which don't. And we're going to uh, walk through a, a, a series of examples on that. So there's 35 faults on the table, uh, which encompasses most rotating machinery problems. They're logically sorted and grouped with respect to the dominant frequency content and the dominant directional response. And 
they help us zero in on the root cause problem. Okay. Um, you know, there's always a difficult problems that uh, there might be two faults or three faults dominant, you know, going on at the same time. This will at least get us in the ballpark, but most of the time it takes us right to the, the root cause. And the final topic we're going to touch on uh, the industrial Internet of Things and um, artificial intelligence in vibration analysis. So I've done this for a couple of years and I look at technology and I see how different companies are progressing. There's companies out there making uh, transducers and having databases and everything is wireless uh, to the cloud type applications. Uh, this kind of looks at that, uh, where we're going and what we've done. And actually some of the things that we talked about uh, a couple of months ago at Grace uh, Products, uh, they're doing things that uh, are following that path and it's a it's a good way to go. It's going to be really exciting in the future. Um, this is the very basics of vibration analysis. And in blue at the top there, the best way to start any vibration analysis training is to provide an overall process view of the main concepts. So here it is listed out. I have my picture on the side. There's seven steps uh, to define the machine of interest. And this is important because we have to know what type of alarms to put on. Not every machine is the same. And statistically, we're going to be able to pull out an alarm level. And this is 0.325 inches per second. So a velocity overall measurement we can put into our database and set up as an alarm, if just knowing the, the type of machine we have. Um, we're going to measure with a calibrated transducer, so 100 millivolts per G. Um, the analog signal is a voltage versus time uh, waveform, and there's multiple wiggles in that waveform. We'll talk about that. We're going to digitize that signal and sample and digitize and turn it into a format that's not an infinite analog signal so that we can get our hands around it. And then we're going to pump that into an FFT processor, a FAST48 processor. FAST48 um, is uh, a way of uh, extracting the periodic events in the time waveform. So you have that complicated waveform, and below it, there are several uh, some more simple waveforms. It's a combination of sinusoids in there, and the processor does that for you. So FAST48 transform takes you from the time domain, which is here, into the frequency domain. So now we can see the amplitudes and the frequency content of that complicated signal. And it's 99% uh, of vibration analysis is in the frequency spectrum. So this is how it's done. So a simple, a simple equation, frequency is one over the period. Um, we can go through it manually, but uh, for complicated problems, complicated uh, waveforms, it's much better to use the processor. Um, this is great knowing what frequencies are there, but we really have to know how much is too much. And this is, the band alarm version of that. So we can set up our alarms based on what kind of machine we have and have this little stair step threshold level that we're going to look for as far as uh, good or bad. Okay? And we can trend all that and run our statistics on our alarm bands and our overall levels and uh, get a good idea if, if the machine is starting to progress towards a, a failure mode. Uh, here's a little uh, graphic that's kind of nice. Uh, if you are listening and you want a copy of this, I, can, I can't give you the PowerPoint, but I can give you a, a PDF of um, the presentation if you're interested and uh, email it to you and let us know. This is where we start. We need to know our machine. So this machine is an overhung direct coupled fan. So on my list of different types of machines. This is an acceptance criteria. This is an alarm value. All these are statistically set. So I would grab a bunch of reciprocating compressors. I would uh, look at all their overall amplitude levels and take the mean plus three sigma and get a, an effective um, alarm level for that machine and do that same exact thing with all of these uh, different types of units. So we have some graphics here, uh, cooling towers, three different kinds of compressors. Uh, and there's five different kinds of fans or blowers. There's uh, motor generator sets, chillers, turbine generators, uh, horizontal pumps, and vertical pumps. Okay, And we get a, a good idea of what our machine is and what their uh, alarm criteria is. So in this case, the little icon is telling me 
0.325. So I have a direct driven overhung fan, 0.325 inches per second, which is a velocity level. Um, and it gets us in the right um, form for uh, setting up our database. This is a transducer. So it comes in a lot of different forms. Uh, this is just a single axis transducer. Uh, the ones that we're going to talk about a little bit later are typically three axis um, triaxial MEMS uh, accelerometers. We'll talk more about it. But the direction is very important. Um, where we go with this one, we're going to measure the machine with a calibrated transducer. Typically, it's an accelerometer. It gives us acceleration. Accelerometers are the best uh, transducer to use, but acceleration is not the best unit to use because it, it has a problem we'll talk about in, uh, on Thursday with some of the basics of vibration. Um, it changes amplitude with speed or with frequency. So we, we, we have a problem with the acceleration parameter and the displacement parameter. Velometers are expensive. Uh, they give you uh, velocity directly, but the accelerometer is easiest because they're cheap and you can mathematically uh, integrate the signal and get velocity out of it. Okay, a lot of jargon, a lot of uh, stuff. Not real important that you know that right now, but accelerometers and velocity are the are the preferred method. Um, we're going to acquire data in multiple directions. If we have a triaxial accelerometer, we just put it on top of the housing. We get X, Y, and Z in one shot. If we have single axis transducers, we're going to have to move them and measure. Uh, horizontal, vertical, and, and another one in the axial direction that's not shown here. Why is that important? If you look at this cartoon that I've made, uh, as the unbalanced vector swings by my red transducer, it's peeking out. As it swings by my blue transducer, it's peeking out 90 degrees later, or a quarter of a revolution later. So this is telling me a couple of things. It's, it's telling me that what the frequency is going on in the machine. I can see that from my periodic event and I can calculate that. I can see the amplitude, but I can also see the phase shift. So there's something going on differently in the vertical and horizontal direction. Okay? And it's just due to moving our transducer 90 degrees. But this will tell us if we have a balance problem. If we have a misalignment or a looseness or a hot bearing or bent shaft, we're going to get a different phase relationship. And that's one of the things we're going to uh, talk about uh, in the industrial internet of things, the wave of the future, if you will. Okay, so we're going to, uh, direction is very important. Vibration faults are directional. You got to keep that in your head. I have a little uh, cartoon, a uh, little cartoon, little animation of a bearing. Uh, so on a shaft, it looks like the bearing's cocked. And in fact, the inner race of the bearing is cocked. So it's kind of pitching the shaft every revolution. Okay? But what's important here, we're going to capture an analog output from the transducer. And it has all the different wiggles, all the vibration of everything that that transducer sees is presented here. Okay? I'm going to tell you what those three wiggles are. You can't see them right now, but you will in a minute. One is the rotation of the shaft. It, it'll put itself, uh, a turning speed of the shaft will put a, a big peak in the spectrum. The other is between each of these balls, there's a, a carrier that separates the balls and keeps them spaced at the right uh, intervals. So they don't bunch up on one side of the bearing. It spins with the shaft, but only about half of shaft speed, about 40% of shaft speed actually. And the third rotating system is the balls themselves. They're spinning as they roll on the raceways. So you have three rotational events going on. The transducer is picking them all up in a raw voltage versus time signal. We apply uh, transducer sensitivity, typically 100 millivolts per G. And now it's a time waveform in acceleration. Okay, Because the, the transducers typically accelerometer will pick up acceleration. We can mathematically change that like we talked about a moment ago, but uh, we don't have to do that right now. Um, so there's the three shaft rotation, the train rotation or the cage of the bearing, and then the rotation of the rolling elements themselves. Number four, um, we sample and digitize the data. We can't take in uh, to a, uh, the FFT processor an analog signal. It's analog signals are infinite. 
So we sample and digitize a very high rate and we grab points, enough points that it really is a bunch of dots, but it, it's they're so close together that it looks like a line. Okay, so we get a good representation of the signal. And then we do where all the magic uh, happens is the FFT processor. Uh, this, the FFT, the fast Fourier transform, basically takes a time domain signal and turns it into a frequency domain signal. The way it does that is it extracts the individual periods and defines them all. So if you look at this uh, first period, it's part of that waveform. I got three different rotational events going on. This would be the lower frequency one, the cage frequency, but you can see it. As you look at all the peaks here, you can see a subtle wave in, the, in this thing. And it starts here, it waves through, and it ends there. So any periodic event, it'll start at a certain point, it'll go to a maximum, it'll go through zero, go to a negative maximum, and then back to zero. Okay. That tells me how long that event is. If we know how long it is, we can calculate the frequency. The frequency in hertz is one divided by the period in seconds. So if we know this is half a second long, one divided by 0.5 is two hertz, two cycles per second, okay? If we're um, like RPM or CPM better, cycles per minute, we multiply it by 60. So that's just a unit change. But that's how they're extracted from here. The FFT processor is pretty complicated. This is the simplest version of that, but we'll pull out the amplitude and frequency of period one, the amplitude and frequency of period two, and of period three. So now we, frequency wise, we know what those three peaks are in the frequency spectrum as well as their amplitudes. So here we are. We are three periodic events. Uh, we extract them all, we apply this Fourier transform, and it gives us those three peaks and where they're spaced in the spectrum. So if we have uh, the turning speed of the shaft, frequency two here, then this is subsynchronous. It's below running speed, below turning speed. This is one times RPM, so it's uh, it's synchronous. And this, we're gonna have to calculate what that is, how it relates back to the turning speed. I'll show you in a second. So what's important, we can identify each peak's uh, frequency, which peak is the rotating speed of the shaft, that's really important and how do the other peaks relate or what ratio do they have with respect to the rotating speed. And the last concept is how do we judge the severity? We don't have any criteria quite yet. That's on the next slide. Now this looks complicated and it's pretty easy. It's once you have it set up, it's, it's kind of a cookie cutter type thing. So this was setting up alarm bands for uh, bearing health, uh, for rolling element bearings. Okay, something that we have. So we have rolling element variance. We're going to use this parameter. Uh, we'll have an overall level, which comes from whatever machine we have. So our overall level is going to be 0.325 inches per second. We'll have subsynchronous, which is 20% of the overall level. That's the amplitude we're going to have. We have a one times RPM range, where it'll be 90% of the overall level. We'll have a two times RPM range or twice running speed. Um, and it's going to be at 40% uh, and three times is 30% and blade pass frequency ranges and bearing defect ranges are 20, 25 and 15%. So we set this up with an idea of how uh, machinery fails. If it's uh, one times RPM, turning speed of the shaft or some harm, small harmonics of that, they're going to be a threshold type alarm. When we get out here, the way bearings fail, the alarm amplitude is very small. So we're, we're trying to pick out really tiny peaks, basically, out of the spectrum and, and apply alarms to them. Uh, the nice thing about the database, you can set your alarms any way you want, and you can set them up to learn so that they'll adjust these levels. These are a good starting point, the 20%, 90%, so forth. Statistically, you can look at every band and you can actually can use as many bands as you like. The result is uh, we have frequency amplitudes and we can compare some severity criteria to them. So I have the stair step program 
and it looks like my uh, frequency at turning speed of the shaft is exceeding that and at uh, this higher frequency out there. Um, they also, once you're in a frequency format, you compare everything to the turning speed of the shaft to see what frequency it is. Uh, frequency one, 739 divided by 1760, the turning speed of the shaft, I get 0.42 times RPM. So it's a subsynchronous frequency. It's below turning speed. If I have a peak at F2, I basically uh, do the same thing, kind of a no-brainer here, but 1760 divided by 1760 is one times RPM. It's turning speed of the shaft. So physically it's turning 1760 times per minute, but it is the one times rotational speed of the shaft, once per revolution. Okay. Um, three, this mystery frequency out here, 8,025, I divide it by 1760 and I get a fraction. It's not four times, it's not five times running speed, it's 4.56. That's telling me it's non-synchronous or it's non-harmonic. And typically that's a varying fr frequency that might be showing up. Okay, we'll get a little bit more in detail with that uh, as we go. This is how we would commonly take our data. And it usually it goes into a database and the database applies the alarms and um, tells us what's, what's bad. And right now it would shoot out a, an alarm report that would say our one times RPM peak in position uh, three on, on the shaft. So the uh, fan bearing three, fan bearing four, they both exceed the criteria in the vertical direction uh, on those two bearings. So that gives us some good information to go and hunt for what the problem is. Okay, so everything's a process of elimination. We start with what what can't what is the problem, what can't be the problem, and we, we move through the whole uh, series, which takes us to the vibration fault periodic table. So this is an invention of full spectrum diagnostics. Uh, we use it in all our training. It gives everything structure and a logical sorting mechanism. Um, we have several things that we're going to talk about. One is there's 35 faults on the table that encompasses just about everything in, in rotating machinery. Um, it's organized by frequency content, which is the columns. So there's a synchronous range, there's harmonic, there's subsynchronous, non-synchronous, and modulation. And we'll show those in detail in a moment. Um, it's organized by directional response, and that's the color of the tile on the table. Red is radial. Yellow is axial, and orange could be radial or axial. Usually it's you know, by design. If I have a gearbox, it's the orientation of the teeth, which really tells it which way it's going to respond. So um, if they're in orange category, they can be either. And lastly, once we've sorted by frequency content and directional response, we can look in the tiles that remain on the table, and they'll tell us what kind of diagnostic to do. And the diagnostics we have are a phase analysis, a time waveform analysis, orbits, transient analysis, or an ultrasonic analysis. And we don't need to know what those are. We just need to know what to do next. You know, if you're sitting down with your vibration guy and your supervisor, it's very likely you don't know a whole lot about vibration analysis. This is made for the, the manager, the supply chain, the asset managers in the whole system to help them understand vibration. And I do this for every analysis I do. Um, I will basically show them this PowerPoint presentation and say, here's how I narrow down your problem. And it's five slides, seven slides, something like that. And we get a logical sort down to here's what your problem probably is. And it's really helpful. Um, you know, they don't know anything about the diagnostics I do, but I just explain them. This is exactly what I've just said to you. It's synchronous problem. It's in the radial direction. It's one of these four. We do a phase analysis and we weed out which one is the oddball in here and we're to our solution. Okay. Pretty much as simple as that. The light throws you uh, curveballs every once in a while, um, like every week for me. Uh, we're going to look at synchronous faults. Okay. So what is synchronous? Synchronous is turning speed of the shaft. Turning speed of the shaft, very important. This is 
what we want to compare all the other faults on the table to. So if our fault is at turning speed and our past example was 1,760 RPM, um, that's going to be uh, what we focus on. So if it's uh, at turning speed, synchronous fault, it's one of these 11 things. And we have to throw in our little oddball. Natural frequencies can occur at any frequency. They're, they're predominantly um, based on the mass and stiffness of the system that's vibrating. Okay, so if they get close to uh, turning speed, you can amplify the response, but they're in every category. So we, we have to prove or disprove everything on here. So right now, synchronous problems, we got rid of all these other grayed out tiles, right? So we went from 35 problems down to 12. So what do we do next? We look at the color, and then what do we do next? We look at what our little icon tells us to do, okay? So there's synchronous problems, and synchronous is turning speed of the shaft. So here, in this case, 1784, we divide it by 1784, we get one times RPM, okay? Um, little fault cursor, I put a little circle on here. The squares are the harmonic cursor. So in your software, you can probably put your cursor on the main peak and see how the other peaks are related to it, right? So two times RPM, three, four, five, and six times. So this is probably a, a blade pass frequency and I have six blades on a pump or a fan and I get a pulsation at that frequency if it's exactly an exact multiple or an exact harmonic. Okay, here's our harmonic faults. Harmonic faults are exact multiples of shaft speed. Okay, notice there's a little overlap. When I have a synchronous problem, it's a dominant one times RPM. And usually there's a dominant one times RPM in this column as well, um, but it's at two times RPM as well. So that you can have a um, two or three times running speed um, harmonics that start showing up. Now uh, you still have to figure out phase wise what the problem is and they all have a little phase icon in there, but for you know nothing simple uh, there's always some overlap uh, harmonics are um, coupling misalignment uh, bent shaft uh, another coupling angular misalignment with cocked bearings and even that animation i just showed you this morning uh, of the bearing and the balls going around it had a cocked inner race so it was uh, rotating and producing usually a twice running speed harmonic so harmonics uh these are one and two times usually. This column is based on the design of the machine. So I'll get a gear mesh at whatever the tooth count times running speed is. So if I have 53 teeth on my gear, I'll get a 53 times running speed peak in the spectrum. If I have blade pass frequency like that last example, 10,704 and I divide it by 1784, I'll get exactly six times so one, two, three, four, five, I'll get exactly six times running speed. That'll be my uh, harmonic, okay? Uh, this column is looseness type problems and they'll generate a whole string of harmonics, either, either uh, fraction, fractional harmonics, exact fractions, or two times, three times, four times, five times, just a whole string uh, when it starts to get loose, okay? Uh, and here's my example, uh, if I have blade pass frequency and that frequency exceeds my threshold, I'll see how it relates to turning speed, 10,704 divided by 1784, I get six times. So it's an exact multiple, it's a harmonic of uh, running speed. Okay? That tells us there's six blades on the fan or the, um, the pump that we're uh, inspecting. Okay, subsynchronous faults, faults that occur at uh, frequencies less than turning speed of the shaft. So if I have a uh, cage frequency, like I, we noted before, it was at 0.42 times running speed, it's less than one times RPM, okay? It's one of these types of problems. So looseness problems can show it, rubs, uh, some gear problems, some electrical problems, and oil whirl and journal bearings and so forth. Um, Subsynchronous and non-synchronous overlap on these two columns. 
So we can have uh, low frequency subsynchronous and non-synchronous problems. Okay. But basically the main uh, definition is subsynchronous is less than the turning speed. Here's my example. Uh, I have a peak at 749 CPM. I have uh, a peak at uh, one times RPM, 1784. And I divide those two, I get 0.419 times running speed. So subsynchronous. Okay. And you can see on the graphic, obviously it's below running speed. Um, Non-synchronous uh, is a group that is not equal to multiples of shaft speed. So they're not harmonics. So any anything in between the whole number of multiples of turning speed are what non-synchronous frequencies are. And this includes oil whirl and oil whip. All the bearing, rolling element bearing frequencies are all non-synchronous. Um, and so how can that be? There's so many different kinds of bearings. Uh, I had a bearing database that had 18,000 bearings in it. And uh, there were three that were exact harmonics. But, you know, you just take it out enough uh, decimal places and it's going to be non-synchronous sooner or later. Anyway, uh, so we have several different non-synchronous peaks uh, uh, sources. Um, one of those is this problem. And, I, and this is a good one because it's so tight. Uh, I have a peak that shows up at 54.41. I divide it by running speed, 1784, I get 3.049. You always take them out three decimal places because this is not a harmonic. It's not three times, it's 3.049. So it's really close. You know, there's your uh, three times. So I have one time, two times, three times, four, five, six. This is my harmonic cursor. So I am not at three times, I'm just above it, okay? Seems subtle, but you'll, you'll get the idea. So that is very likely a very defect frequency that's showing up. Uh, the last uh, grouping is modulation. This is a, uh, what shows up, well, it's not, a lot of times you can hear it. It's a pulsating combination of faults. So here I had that pulsating combination of faults. Uh, listening to it, you can hear the pulsing sometimes. Measuring it in the time waveform, uh, a lot of times it's a lobing beat frequency that you'll see. But in the spectrum, it's something a little bit different. It, it has what's called side bands. So I'm, the only way to show you this is to show you by example. Um, I have my, my peaks I've been playing with all along. It's, it's still the machine at 1784 RPM turning speed. Um, I have my harmonic cursor. None of these line up. They're all non-synchronous, okay? I put my cursor on 20,516 divided by running speed, I get 11 and a half times running speed. So it's non-synchronous. It's not 11 times, it's not 12 times, it's 11.5 uh, times, okay? So I start doing the same thing with all the other peaks, divide them by turning speed. So I have 13.5, 12.5, 11.5, 10.5, and 9.5, which is they're all non-synchronous, but they're all separated by turning speed frequency. So 20,516 minus 1784, I get 18,732. And I subtract turning speed from it again, I get 169. So this is how modulation works. There's a center frequency that might be some, uh, some known frequency and then side bands uh, on either side, plus or minus the exact spacing. So uh, we'll get more into that as we go, but that's one of, um, one of the fault categories, the last one. Okay, so we, we sort it by frequency and then we uh, sort it by color or direction. In this case, the dominant direction for the red uh, blocks is in the radial direction. So either horizontal or vertical or both, okay? The dominant direction for the yellow blocks is axial. And this is the big separator in the synchronous problems. So we can eliminate, you know, if we have radial response, there's four possible uh, synchronous problems that produce radial response. If we um, have an axial response, there's six possible. And the gear is orange, it can be in either direction. But we can wipe out a whole bunch of possibilities uh, right off the bat with uh, knowing what direction is dominant. 
Oh, and there's one oddball out here. Um, the bearing uh, cage frequency, the spacer uh, between all the balls. Uh, when it rotates, if it, there's a thrust load on it, it will respond in that direction. And you'll start to see an axial uh, peak in spectrum, uh, which is unusual. That's the only one that bearing frequency to acts in the axial direction. Uh, radial and or axial fault group. This is uh, a lot of times by design of the machine. So if we have a gear uh, gearbox, it can be a right angle gearbox, it can be herringbone, it can be a spur gear. It, you know, that configuration might give us an idea of what direction is going to be dominant. But as far as we know, it's a gearbox without looking inside. Um, so it's an orange. It can be either direction. Electrical, they can be uh, multiple directions, natural frequencies, turbulence, things like that. Um, there's no really pronounced direction. It could be uh, any, any of the three. Um, and then we narrow down the possibilities. So the recommended diagnostic is the icon in the upper right-hand corner of each tile. Uh, and I mentioned before, we have phase analysis, time waveform, orbit, transient, and ultrasonic analysis. Okay, phase analysis, very good for uh, synchronous problems. Time waveform, very good for gear type uh, problems. Orbits, if I have uh, journal bearings, that's what the best method we use to figure out what's wrong with them is with an orbit plot, transient analysis for different natural frequency problems, and ultrasonics for bearing problems. So bearing inner race, uh, ball spin, outer race, and cage frequency, and even bearing natural frequencies uh, will show up occasionally. Okay? So they all have their place. This is telling us what to do. So I've sorted by frequency content, I've sorted by direction, and then I go and do my diagnostic test to narrow it down, hopefully to the root cause. All right, so this is a lot of stuff, but without a demonstration, um, it's not as uh, acceptable. So we got one more little twist on this. So I got a real world example here. We have a uh, AC induction motor, it's direct coupled. Uh, we have a bearing, it's a center hung fan, uh, inner and outer bearings, they're rolling elements in this case. Um, so everything's uh, set up. Uh, what else do I have? Uh, it's an AC motor, so it's not DC. Okay. I'm going to start the sorting process based on this. So the first thing we can do, we don't know have any vibration at all. Uh, here's a series of blocks that are design related. So we have to consider that machine design, the drive type, the uh, coupling, the driven machine type, the bearing type, and the rotor configuration. And you know, we're going to walk through each one of those for our example here. So I have an AC induction motor. I can get rid of DC electric problems and fluting. As long as this, uh, and people might have, you might not know what fluting is. It's electro erosion of the raceways and the bearing from discharges of either current or voltage. So if this was a DC motor that, that occurs sometimes, it, AC induction motors on variable frequency drives, it can also occur. So, um, but if it's just an AC induction motor, usually it's electrically, it's, it's pretty good and you, you'll never get uh, the erosion problems. But there's two blocks that we, just based on what we know about the machine, we can get rid of those two. Direct coupled, meaning that there's no gearbox, so the four gearbox problems could go away and two belt drive problems go away. Okay. Rolling element bearings throughout my oil whirl and oil whip. These are journal bearing problems that they go away. Center hung rotor, my overhung rotor on balance doesn't apply. It's a not a specialty machine. So there's something called roll barring in the paper and aluminum and steel industry uh, that doesn't apply to this. And what happened? All of my gray blocks here, I went from 35 possible um, faults down to 23, and I haven't done any vibration analysis yet. It's all based on machine design. Okay. And I can't tell you how helpful this is. Uh, a lot of times you'll try to prove that you're running through in your head uh, as you're doing diagnostics and you forget about certain things you say you know what about this problem or that problem and it's already off the chart if you don't have this chart 
and this structure, logical sorting mechanism, uh, you, you go in circles sometimes, and I've, I've been there. Okay. We're going to consider the frequency grouping. So this is the data for our machine, our direct drive, drive um, direct coupled overhung fan or center home fan. Um, we have peaks in the spectrum. There's nothing axially. There's nothing in the horizontal direction, vertical direction. The motor's fine and bearings three and four. There's a vertical uh, one times RPM peak that's showing up in the spectrum. Okay, how do I know this is one times RPM? That's how this alarm band is generated. So I have a little one times, I have a little two times, and I have a little what's it, three, four, five, six times. Okay. So that's how we originally set it up in the database. So the database is telling us you have alarms at position three and four in the vertical directions at turning speed of the shaft. Okay. So it's a synchronous problem. It's at turning speed of the shaft. It's at one times RPM. It's the first two columns on the table plus the natural frequency. So we had all these uh, blocks selected. Everything that's not synchronous will also go away. So those blocks all through here, except for natural frequency. So it's not a bearing frequency. It's not electrical. It's not all that. It's synchronous. So we're down to nine problems. We went from 35 to 23. Now we are at nine pot uh, potential problems. We're going to sort by color next or by uh, direction, dominant direction. And you go back to this, there's no axial vibration, which is nice. So horizontal and vertical, they're um, radial vibration, and only the vertical one has the alarms to it. So we can say that this is uh, not an axial problem. So the yellow blocks go away. And we're stuck with, after just sorting two times and removing the uh, faults that are based on design, we're down to five different faults that it could possibly be. Okay. So what do we do next? Uh, we do what the table tells us to do next. We perform a recommended diagnostic. Upper right-hand corner, we have phase, 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 and phase for these synchronous problems. And we have transient analysis for uh, the natural frequency problem. Okay. This is the, one of the two tests that we traditionally use to uh, look for natural frequencies. One is a waterfall plot where we can start or stop our unit, or if we have control of speed somehow, we can either do a startup or a coast down or a controlled speed change. And uh, we can uh, see if there's a peak in the spectrum uh, close to some operating condition. Okay. The easier way, I think, is to do a natural frequency impact test. So you get an instrumented hammer, you hit the machine like a, uh, ring it like a bell, and the frequencies that come out of that ringing are telling you what the natural frequencies are. Okay. So we do that type of testing all the time. So in this case, uh, we couldn't find a natural frequency. So what's left? Uh, these four phase uh, diagnostics for unbalanced eccentricity, uh, looseness type A, and alignment offset uh, in the radial direction. What are those tests? These are the categories. So doing the phase test, um, not really important right now. Understanding it, uh, what it gets you is, is very important. So I check for unbalanced and eccentricity. I should have a horizontal to vertical phase shift of 90 degrees at each bearing. So all I do is check the boxes for those that apply. I do a little survey of the whole machine, uh, see how one point is related to a reference location, and I can see how it's moving, just a rough, a rough animation of the machine. Uh, I check for misalignment across the coupling. If the cu coupling's moving out of phase, either radially or axially, um, it's a good check for, hey, you got something misaligned in that coupling. In this case, we didn't have that. We had normal unbalanced conditions at low level. Uh, we had no eccentricity. The only one we did have, we had a lot of vertical response, and that's a good signature for uh, soft foot conditions. So basically it had a, a foot uh, that was shimmed improperly or had too many shims or they forgot to do it or the bolt was loose or broken, there's some, some condition in a, 
one footing foot on the machine that gave us fits. And uh, in this case, looseness type A is that type of fault. So we end up with uh, looseness type A. Okay. Everybody can understand this. It's just sorting things and using what you know to eliminate problems. Um, and if you can't eliminate them, they stay on the table. Right. Okay, I'm going to jump to a, a little different topic, uh, the industrial internet of things, artificial intelligence and vibration analysis. Um, I have about 15 minutes left, I think. Um, I'm going to try to get some questions in after this. If you guys uh, have questions, you can type them in to your computer and they'll show up on the facilitator screen and uh, we'll answer those. So this is uh, something I've done the last couple of years, and I, I continue to look at where the technology is going with a wireless transducer, in-cloud, data storage, all that type of stuff. Um, the gold standard is every, the thing that everybody's looking for is the permanent wireless transducers, 24-7 monitoring that can do a lot of things. And the four things that are of main interest right now are overall vibration trending, which is just an, an energy level response of the machine um, and overall ultrasonic trending, which is a filtered high frequency uh, failure mode for rolling element bearings. You'll get really small impacts that you can only see in the high frequency range. Um, a lot of people are going to that, hoping transducers that can do both. Um, On-demand time waveform and spectrum capability. Uh, it's real important if you have uh, an overall level that exceeds a certain criteria uh, that you do a, a waveform or a spectrum to see what's really going on. And there's some clue frequency content wise what's what's happening. And then uh, probably the hardest one is on-demand phase analysis, or you know, in my case, animation capability. Uh, I'm showing you a, a, a pump and it probably had 30 measurements on it. Um, and these were all amplitude and phase type measurements. They were all simultaneously acquired. Um, so I can see how the machine's moving and I can get an animation like this. If we have on-demand phase analysis, meaning can one transducer link and talk to the other one simultaneously, then we can do something like this on a rudimentary scale uh, for every machine. Assuming, you know, things in the future keep going the way they are and these uh, wireless transducers get smaller and more uh, battery efficient and uh, you can link them all together on a machine. You can put just a, a sonar net of transducers on your machine and get all kinds of uh, animation response and phase response. Um, gold standard is also the transducers are powered by an infinite energy source, which never will happen. But. Um, you know, battery technology is getting better and better. So that's uh, something to watch. Um, transducer sen sensor nets that can talk point to point and acquire data simultaneously. We just kind of went over that as far as uh, that's what this allows. And actually, we can do phase analysis uh, right away. That can be part of the algorithm. If we have a point to point acquired data, uh, we know the phase shifts from point to point and what they should be. We can uh, program that into our uh, software and we can basically have smart smart machines, smart sensors. Um, artificial intelligence algorithms designed for trending, detecting, assessing, and defining machinery problems. This is you know, phase analysis that we can do on the fly, which would be fantastic. Um, vibration data training interfacing with other plant process variables. Uh, most MEMS uh, transducer will get you uh, temperature as well, which is good. They can do pressure, or well, they can't, the transducer can't, but we should, the plant usually will uh, have pressures, flow, speed, and efficiency on some type of uh, data system or PI system. Uh, the idea is to link to that so we can get another, you know, non-vibration measurement that might uh, be part of the puzzle. Um, infinite data storage and monitoring capability in the cloud, everybody's going to that. So it's not inexpensive, but it's, it's, uh, it seems like we have enough data storage now. And the, the real thing is to work on uh, the price and the battery life. So the price point is, is low for these MIMS transducers, and they are triaxial most of the time. And it's a, it's a good 
it, it's a good place. There's going to be a big jump soon, I think. Um, this the last one is on-site vibration and analysis analyst is eliminated or replaced with remote online monitoring. I think it, we're not there yet. That might be in the future. There might be just uh, smart algorithms that will tell you when your machine's going to fail. But uh, and vibration is so subtle sometimes, and so there's multiple things that happen, and it defies uh, the linear logic sometimes. Um, but the more transducers you have, if I had 24 transducers on my machine instead of four, I could do a lot more. So it all depends on, you know, pricing of transducers and how they can link together and acquire data. Um, this is uh, kind of the flow chart. So I have uh, acquiring data with my transducer uh, up here. I can also acquire phase data, like we've mentioned. If, if all these transducer locations are, are linked together, um, I can get live phase analysis, which is fantastic. So we have uh, overall vibration levels, we have time waveforms, we have spectrums that we can capture, right? Right now, we're doing little packets of uh, overall levels. So we're get the, getting the least diagnostic information but if something changes and goes into alarm, that prompts us to take a spectrum, take a waveform. And we don't have to take it everywhere. We can target the location that uh, uh, the alarm came from. So once we have that, we can start using this type of logical sorting, sorting mechanism that uh, will be able to tell us what the, the root cause of the problem is. Uh, current state of the art uh, is route trending. And why do we stop that? Uh, it's There's a lot of inaccessible uh, locations. There's dangerous things that you can't monitor as well as you'd like to. There's perfect for um, permanently mounted uh, battery powered units, especially a lot of places I go like refineries. There's, you know, you just don't want to be close to some of these machines. Uh, what they have out in the market right now, battery powered units, uh, they do everything. They do the trending, the ultrasonic, the spectrum, the waveform, phase analysis, orbits. They can do um, all kinds of natural frequency tests. Anything you think of, they're thrown into these portable units. Now. It's just, you know, you have to have a, a skilled guy that knows vibration and knows how to use it and to get the most out of it. Um, databases were constructed with these, so we're uploading and downloading data constantly. Uh, they don't really have algorithms. They have some statistical analysis they can use, but uh, you do have to have a five guy that knows what he's doing. Um, infinite storage, you know, storage really isn't an issue anymore with hard drives being as big as they are. Uh, price point is low and acceptable. And when you throw all the costs in, I, I came up roughly at about $25 a point, which is what, uh, $400 a machine? No, 300, sorry. So um, not bad. Um, On-site or contract vibration uh, required? Yeah, there's still there's still a place for that. Um, manual route-based portable uh, data. So this is the kind of stuff you're going to get. You'll get a spectrum. You'll get uh, overall levels. So here I'm, I'm moving between uh, different overall levels and going in and out of alarms. And you can see how the spectrum is changing. This is what we don't get, the spectrum over here from just uh, a single point. So this is just telling me I'm at, uh, don't have that number, oh, Y. Here I'm at 0.334 inches per second. So I'm in alarm, but this is the information I need to make a call on a piece of machinery. Okay, there are supplemental spot checking methods. A lot of places will uh, give the operators, like in power plants, uh, an overall meter, and they'll go out. It's battery uh, powered. It's storing just a value. Um, it, there's no algorithms, uh, minimal vibration uh, analysis uh, training required. Data storage is limited, but you can download it. Price is low, so it's... It's good. You're making use of your operators and people who are walking around um, writing something on a clipboard. Instead, you're getting an actual measure. But it's only as good as uh, the operators make it. This uh, current wireless system options, um, 
a lot of them, the first one, they're going to semi-permanent mounted data collection to get some of this capability. Uh, transducer battery powered in some uh, cases, and sometimes they're um, wired in as well. But here's, here's the thing that makes it uh, really valuable. If you do a route-based uh, vibration analysis, you're only getting about 12 measurements a year at any given point on your machine. 12 measurements is tiny. I have an example here to the right. This was four days worth of data, one, one data point per hour, so about 94 measurements. Um, if we get this, we can get better uniform data collection because it's magnet mounted. Nobody's walking around and touching a different point. Uh, they, it never gets moved. You're going to get better repeatable trends and you're going to get massive amounts of data. If I'm route based, it's 12 measurements a year. If I'm a wireless rate on a, on a permanently mounted transducer, if I do one per day, I'm getting 365 measurements in a year. One per hour, uh, almost 8,800 measurements. I get about a half a million measurements if I do one every minute. So we know this is crazy, but how crazy is it? When I look at this, um, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, price point is lower, um, still need a vibe guide, so forth. Okay, this data is the, the starting point. So I have some alarm levels that are mean plus three sigma. It's based on the real data and it's just statistics, okay? This is where the alarm probably will occur. Um, this was a plot of regular vibration velocity, which are the red dots, and this scale is acceleration. So it's uh, peak view, it's um, ultrasonic measurement and some of the stats on that. But this is what you can do with the single point wireless transducer. You can take that data and you can get, you know, this was 94 measurements. This was one an hour. And I can see massive statistical changes. The gray uh, was initial, you know, the first couple hours, it's pretty ragged. And then all of a sudden it starts zeroing in on a much better statistical alarm level. And this is only four days. It's, I think it's something that's uh, phenomenal for just a basic vibration monitoring, you, know, you still need to get a spectrum and a waveform, but it's telling us a lot more um, than, than we think it is. And I was just using basic statistics and, and having them update every hour. And it, it gets a really nice trend. Um, evolving systems, uh, wireless semi-permanent mounting data uh, collection. There's a lot of them out there that will do wired and battery powered or it's, it's, you have the option of either. Um, data stored, uh, oh, spectrum and waveform can be collected on alarm or by request. That's really important because you don't want to be pumping spectrum uh, every day. You'll get a, a, you'll wear the batteries out in no time. Uh, price point still high, capability is increasing. So it's it's out there. It's it's elusive. Every time we want to do something, it's hey, mate, what if we do this? And that might cost a little more money. So it's it's pushing in the right direction, but it's 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 got to be evolving all the time, which I believe it is. Um, this is in fact this is one of the time waveforms from one of, one vendor out there, which is horrible. There, it doesn't even look like a vibration spec uh, time waveform spectrum. This is the spectrum, which looks pretty good. And I don't think these were collected at the same time. This looks like noise to me. This looks like uh, harmonics. So there's maybe a looseness problem or a misalignment problem. It's telling us something is going on here and it gives us a clue. Uh, this is another vendor where they narrow banded everything. This is a rolling element bearing uh, raceway frequency. And it was on a gearbox and it was just buried in the noise floor. So we had to put it on a log scale, put some specialty alarms in it, and we could start picking it out. So there is a lot of things you can do with the databases as far as um, pulling things out that uh, are very subtle. Okay, future battery power transducers, unlimited life is what we want, uh, power compromise. Uh, we'd love to go uh, just full battery, 
Um, our transducers are getting better. The MEMS design, the mi micro electrico, elect I can't quite say it, micro electromagnet mechanical systems. So MEMS. Um, integrating plant process parameters, creating algorithms, and we haven't even started creating algorithms yet for real subtleties of overall vibration. Um, synchronization of transducers to get phase analysis. Um, basically the elimination for, for uh, on-site vibration analysis, which I don't really approve of. I think he has a very useful function, but you know, if you supplement it with an off-site guy or a contractor, you can also do that. So here's our, our grand look, overall look at everything. We, we acquire our data, overall trends, time waveform spectrum. We're, we're isolating potential problems. We're pulling up uh, our current rule base and seeing what's good and bad in overall vibration or individual peaks in the spectrum. We're comparing that to plant processes. So where, where are we on the pump curve or the fan curve? That could be the entire problem, but we're never comparing our vibration to plant process. And maybe we don't know that. Um, we update our machinery animation. So we can have, uh, depending on what kind of net of transducers we have, we can get some decent animation. And then even applying a rule base for potential faults. So maybe this is moving like this, but it's not a uh, high enough amplitude that it's an issue yet. We can still say, hey, here's our potential problems. We might have a loose foot or a soft foot. We might have a uh, misaligned coupling. And we might have some blade pass frequency problems that are showing up. And then we apply that and get a better idea of where we sit statistically and then start the process over. So it's doing this not 12 times a year, every hour, every minute, you're getting an update and a better idea of, of what your machine's trying to tell you, if it's hurting or if it's in fact dumb and happy. All right, I've blown through an hour, barely. Sorry about that, I tried to hold it to an hour. If you guys have questions, um, I think Nick will get back on. If you need to contact me uh, or you want a, um, a PDF of this presentation. I'd be more than happy to email you one. So let me know. Um, and you can contact me if you have any other questions about training. Good morning. Uh, this is Dan Ambre from Full Spectrum Diagnostics. On the behalf of Grace Engineered Products, uh, this is part two of the Introduction to Vibration Analysis. Uh, a little bit about me, my company, Full Spectrum Diagnostics. We do certification and uh, uh, testing and all different levels of vibration of all kinds of different classes. Uh, I've been doing it 30 years and there's always something new that pops up. We also have some live uh, certification training. We do it on site at the customer site or we uh, do have public classes in the Midwest as well. Um, but what we're getting into now and based on all this uh, virus stuff is more of the interactive training. So a lot of webinar formats like we're about to get today uh, and some uh, online classes that I already have a learning management system on my website if you're interested in something like that. So uh, always something new. Um, what you're seeing on the screen is the vibration fault periodic table. This is something that was invented by Full Spectrum Diagnostics and it's a guide and gives you structure to your analysis. And we're gonna be using it today to show how it works. Uh, we did some of that on Tuesday uh, these will be a little different uh, examples, uh, but same sort of format. Um, our company, get to it. Our company also has a machinery analysis division. And I mentioned this uh, on Tuesday that uh, we do experimental modal analysis, which is looking for natural frequencies and structures and operating deflection shape where you're trying to get uh, operating information about your machinery and uh, trying to diagnose its response. Mm -hmm. uh, a big part of that is the animations that are uh, created when you do this. So you uh, get a good measurement mesh uh, of your machine and uh, you bring it to life. You can put your cursor on any frequency of interest, anything that's uh, out of the ordinary, and it'll show you the animated shape. Um, and like I mentioned the other day, uh, this is, unbelievably useful. 
Uh, I've been in large crowds of people where I've presented vibration analysis uh, studies and things that I've done, and you lose the room almost completely unless they're engaged with something. And this brings total engagement. Everybody in the room can look at this animation and say, yeah, there's, there's something wrong. That looks like the coupling is misaligned. Yeah, exactly. And then they're all raising their hands trying to offer something that they can do to make the problem go away. So my, uh, my little, uh, a little saying for this, we're trying to make vibration analysis visible and workable throughout the, our customer's management chain so, so they can be involved in their own asset management solutions, which is which is true. Everybody's helping. So it, it really makes my job uh, easier and, and a lot more enjoyable. Uh, third thing we have is we have an imaging division. Uh, something new that came out. Uh, there's a lot of uh, high-speed video cameras out there. This is a version by uh, Vibrant Technology, makers of Emiscope, the animation software that I just showed you uh, on the last slide. Uh, this video clip is processed with something called, it's a little different from others out there. It's a optical flow algorithm. It enhances subtle displacement, rescales the amplitudes, and now you can see things you haven't seen before. And uh, this is a bearing ho uh, housing on a, on a fan outboard bearing, you can see how it's moving. And this is real life, it's it's amplified, so you know, obviously, but they had all kinds of problems with this thing. And they were always looking at the at the top where the bolt bolted section uh, for the bearing, and that's always been tight and they've over tightened it and caused other problems. What they didn't do was go down and look in here. This is the, the foundation and it looks like the, it's an accordion, the way this thing's moving. Actually, it's down in this area where the grouted in base, something's loose under there. Either one of the bolts is pulled out or uh, uh, there's a, a fracture or something in the grout line that's causing this motion. But it's uh, we wouldn't have been able to diagnose it unless we had this type of visual uh, animation. All right, uh, introduction to vibration analysis part two. Uh, we're going to talk about the basics of vibration analysis. So amplitude is a uh, how much vibration is present. Frequency is, is how often does it occur. It's a rate of occurrence. So we can uh, pinpoint what's causing that high amplitude. And the third really useful parameter is phase. And it's a measure of uh, directional relative motion. And we'll get into that quite a bit. Part two, we're going to focus on amplitude. And amplitude is a severity parameter. We can trend, displacement, velocity, or acceleration, and we can do any one of those. The, there is a preferred uh, parameter, and we'll, we'll talk more on that. Um, so uh, the basic idea is understanding the energy levels and how those levels might uh, impact the machine. And then we're going to talk a little bit about transducers, uh, recommended severity parameters, uh, overall vibration trending and analysis, and some statistics. Uh, I want to lead into ultrasonic data trends, and we're going to probably get into that next Tuesday. Uh, this is a secondary trending mechanism that the GRACE transducers have to offer. The, the first is you're going to take an overall level, you're going to trend that. They also have uh, spectrum and waveform capability on demand, but also they're putting in uh, one of the transducers in the triaxial is going to be a higher frequency transducer, and we can uh, play with that, filter it, and adjust it so that we can see ultrasonic vibration. Uh, and what that is, is very high frequencies, and it's early indication of bearing failure. So I think next time I, I might uh, mix it up a little bit and show you some ultrasonic trends and some uh, technologies out there that, that might uh, be of benefit for uh, the GRACE product. Um, PDM process, uh, this is the overview that we talked about the other day. And again, I'm going to be a little redundant uh, and walk through this real quick, just so everybody's up to speed that if you didn't make it on Tuesday, a uh, little seven step process that uh, from finding the machine of interest to understanding the spectrum. Okay. First of all, the best thing to do is to know your machine. So the machine I have shown here is a direct driven overhung fan application. It's on isolators and there's a machine base under that. That's not much more information, but the, this is a class of machinery. On the right here is the, the acceptance levels and alarm levels for three, four, five, six, seven different classes of machinery. And there's like 18 different machine types in, involved in this. 
Uh, what we have is a fan or blower. There's integral shaft, direct driven and belt driven. We have a direct driven version of that. And uh, the icons along the bottom here will show you what all those machines kind of look like in profile. This is our fan or blower unit. Um, it's telling me that the vibration allowable level for this machine statistically is 0.325 inches per second. So this is a velocity measurement. And we're going to talk more about velocity and displacement and acceleration in a minute. Uh, but this is the alarm level that would be set in the software system. So the machine's taking data every hour, every minute, what have you. And it's constantly comparing the, uh, the data it's just uh, accumulated to uh, the allowable alarm level, which is this 0.325. This will change. This is just this whole acceptance and alarm criteria is st statistically set, but it's across the industry. Your machine's different from every other machine on here. And each machine, I might have five of these fans all lined together. They're all different. They're all going to have their own alarm criteria. They're all going to have different levels of vibration. The nice thing about having these, these real-time sensors that are bolted in place or magnet mounted in place is that they'll continuously take data. And any subtle change from the mean level is going to be recorded. And as, as a result, uh, somebody I mentioned uh, on Tuesday, the alarm levels are the mean level plus three sigma. So statistically, that's three standard deviations above and below the mean curve for the data that it calculates. So uh, as it goes in, the uh, database calculates uh, a new mean level, a new based on old data and the current data and new statistical data, and your alarm curves get better and better. So this machine might start out at 0.325, but it might be down uh, 0.275 by the time uh, all this statistical analysis is done. There's really a lot of great artificial intelligence uh, in the databases that can really make machine learning uh, a good experience. So machine of interest is this direct coupled over on fan. The main point is we have to define what is that alarm level so that we can start this uh, data collection process and make it meaningful, okay? This is uh, acquiring the data. We acquire the data with a transducer. This is just showing a single axis uh, accelerometer and what it looks like on the inside. The uh, GRACE transducers are a little different. They have uh, their uh, working element is on a, a chip inside the, uh, the housing enclosure. And it's a MEMS uh, transducer, uh, me mechanical electrical, ele mechanical electro machine, uh, anyway, system, something like that. I can never remember what that means. Um, you know, so anyway, it's some type of transducer. It's calibrated. So this shows 100 millivolts per G. That's pretty common. Accelerometers will put out an acceleration signal. Uh, it starts out as a, a voltage. Uh, we turn it into acceleration by giving it this calibration factor, uh, and it's somewhere around 100 millivolts per G. So, and it's when you get your transducer, it'll give you uh, exactly what that number is. Um, the accelerometer measures acceleration. Okay, there's a, a reason that we take data with accelerometers. It's because they're they're cheap and they're very useful. What we would like, we don't want acceleration parameter in our measurement, we would rather have velocity. And I take you back to the last page, all these little numbers here, these are all velocity values. Velocity is a, a better severity indicator. Uh, we can do that two ways. We can use a velometer, which, or a seismic velocity transducer, but the, this one's expensive. The seismic ones are mechanical and they fail and they're not nearly as good as an accelerometer with no moving parts. So what we do instead of measuring velocity directly, we measure it with the accelerometer and we mathematically integrate it into velocity. Probably a little too much noise for most of the people out there. Uh, you don't really care about that, but that's the process. So that's why I have my, my green uh, bolded accelerometer and, and the velocity parameter. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, Proximity probes are one of the other transducers. Uh, I believe that uh, there's a way to pull those into the database as well if they're already installed on the machine. Uh, 
So data is acquired. Our preferred, preferred transducer is an accelerometer. Our preferred vibration parameter is velocity. And we have to remember uh, vibration faults are directional. I'm showing you uh, two transducers, one vertical and one horizontal. The unbalanced vector is sweeping by and it peaks out as it goes by the red transducer on the red curve here. And 90 degrees later, the blue one's gonna peak out. So what does this mean? They're out of phase by a quarter of a revolution. Okay, so the heavy spot takes a quarter of a revolution longer to go by the blue uh, peak. And these two directions will have different amplitudes. They can have different frequency content. They can have all kinds of differences. So if I don't measure the horizontal, the vertical, and the axial, uh, I'm gonna miss something. Uh, thankfully, uh, a lot of transducers now are triaxial. And that MEMS accelerometer is also triaxial. So uh, we'll pick up all three directions simultaneously. Uh, what do we get? We get an analog waveform. This is voltage versus time until we put in that 100 millivolt per G calibration factor. What we're seeing is all the vibration in the system. So let's assume I'm taking a measurement on the bearing housing here. I'm picking up the rotation of the shaft. I'm picking up the cage frequency, which is the spacer between all the balls. It'll rotate at about 40% of shaft speed. So this might be 1800, this might be 900 RPM. The balls, they spin as well. So they have another uh, vibration signature. So when you look at this, it's a complicated time waveform. It's the combination of those three different frequencies in there, okay? Kind of hard to pick out what's what, but uh, we'll we'll fix that. So shaft rotation, rolling element, train rotation, and the rotation of the rolling elements. Those are the three components of this so far. We can't take in that uh, voltage measurement. It's, it's uh, analog and it's infinite. So what uh, we do before we pull it into our uh, data acquisition system is we have to digitize it. So we sample it, we digitize it at a really high rate so that if looking at this, it is a bunch of dots, but you wouldn't be able to see it because there's so many dots and they're so close together. But this is the way the computer can understand it. Okay, so we'll put in that uh, millivolts per G number, we'll pull it into our data collector, we'll sample it and digitize it, and then it's ready for the real, the real analysis, which is the fast Fourier transform. The fast Fourier transform, it's a, a uh, fast, a computer method for the Fourier series, which is a, an infinite series. They do some tricks in the computer program that makes it quicker so that you don't have to wait for infinity. Um, we apply this processing to complex signals, and we're assuming the complex signals are a sum of periodic events. In this case, uh, it's very periodic, so sinusoidal, uh, repeating patterns in there. So we have three different periodic effects in here. And one is the shaft, one is the cage for the bearing, and one is the ball themselves. The FFT processor defines those individual periodic events and pulls them out. So it strips them away from the complex signal. So this low level uh, wiggle here, if you look at all the peaks, you can see a low level wiggle in, in the waveform. So it's, uh, it's, it's buried in there somewhere. There's another peak uh, of the different uh, period length and it's the repeating period, the uh, rotational speed of the shaft. This is a higher frequency peak, which is probably the ball spin frequency. Uh, has a shorter period, is higher frequency. Longer period, lower frequency. So basically what we've done, we've taken a time domain signal, this complex time waveform, we've converted it to the frequency domain. And the way we do that is with the Fourier transform, but uh, this is the sim simplistic way to do it. The frequency in Hertz is equal to one cycle over how many seconds it took to make that cycle. Okay. So I pick out one cycle. I start here. I go through a maximum, a minimum, and back to uh, the original point again. If I know how long that was, let's say it was uh, half a second, one divided by 0.5 is two Hertz. Okay. Two cycles per second. If I'm a CPM person, a cycles per minute type person, I can multiply it by 60 and it'd be 120 RPM, basically. Okay, so Hertz are the units of cycles per second and the period is, is in terms of seconds. And the whole idea is to strip out these components and 
turn it into a frequency spectrum, which is what we're doing here. So I have the same uh, periodic events up at the top, uh, three different periods. Uh, if I use that uh, frequency as one over the period, I can calculate their frequency component. F1 is this low frequency period. F2 is the green one, a little higher fr uh, frequency, but that's the period uh, length. And the third one is the, the ball spin frequency, which is a, sh a shorter uh, wavelength there. Okay, So I've just done the simple calculation, and I have my three frequency. What I want to do and what's important, identify each peak's frequency. So I go in here and put my cursor on it and it'll it'll tell me what that frequency is now those will show up in the next step uh choose my parameter it's either hertz or rpm or cpm usually rpm is the reserve for just the rotating speed of the shaft but rpm and cpm are basically the same unit cycles per minute revolutions per minute same deal uh which peak is the rotating speed of the shaft that's super important so we go look on our our bearing our our drawings, whatever uh, we, we use when we design the machine, and we find out what the rotational speed is supposed to be. If I go onto the bearing uh, or the uh, motor nameplate, I can uh, find that value, and it'll be close to what the actual under load uh, speed is. But if it says 1765 RPM, it's probably you know a two pole or a four pole motor that synchronous speed is 1800, but they don't ever run right at the synchronous speed. So roughly 1800 RPM, um, and that is what the information I need to know because I'm gonna ratio all the other peaks to that speed. So if that peak is 1760, I'm gonna take this uh, frequency and divide it by 1760 to see how these two are related. And the same thing, same thing between one and two there. How do we judge severity? We don't have any alarms on this yet. Okay. Right now, we probably have uh, overall alarms on the waveform, uh, but assuming that we're generating a spectrum, we have to have something to compare it to. The alarms define how much is too much. Okay. Frequency band alarms define uh, where all our frequency ranges will have limits. Uh, this is a, you know, a cookie cutter uh, calculation for making this stair step pattern. This pattern is percentages of the overall level. So I take 0.325 inches per second. That's my overall vibration that I'm trending. Um, I can make alarms out of that, fractions of that uh, in the frequency domain. Okay. Uh, I have to know a little bit of information. Uh, I want to know how my one times RPM relates to the other frequencies. And I can use my periodic table chart to help me with that. If I find out the rotating speed is 1760, that's F2. I want to find what out what this peak down here is. I put my cursor on it. It says 739. I divide it by running speed. And now I can see how it uh, relates to running speed. It's 0.42 times RPM. So it's 40% of the speed of the uh, shaft. Okay. The F2 is 1760. So I, I know that that's the running speed. So that equates to the one times RPM. That's a synchronous frequency. Uh, I go out here, put my cursor on F3. It's 8025 uh, CPM divided by running speed. And I get 4.56. This is non-synchronous. It's not an exact harmonic. It's not four times running speed or five times running speed. It's 4.56. Okay, if I have non-synchronous peaks, uh, like this, uh, it will be a, most likely a bearing defect frequency. Okay, we have four different bearing defect frequencies. They're all non-synchronous. So if we're looking for peaks in this range, uh, that's likely to be what it is. But we, we have a way of, uh, with the periodic table, to add a little structure and method to it so we can narrow down. it. Okay. Speaking of which, this is uh, the, the periodic table, and we went through it a little bit on Tuesday, but uh, we're going to do a quick example. It's a different example, so even if you missed it, it'll be something new. Uh, design of the machine, uh, we're going to look at things, things uh, faults that can't apply. There's 35 different faults. Some of them can't apply because they're not part of the machine design, and you know, there's no gearbox. There's no belt drive uh, for this application, so those can come off the table. 
So I did it all at once instead of one at a time. Um, I have an AC induction motor. So DC motor problems go away and fluting goes away. I have rolling element bearings. So there's no, no uh, oil whirls from journal bearings. There's no gearbox. There's one, two, three, four different gearbox uh, faults. Those come off the table. There's no belt drive. There's a belt drive misalignment and a belt frequency. They come off the table. Uh, it's not a pump. It's a fan. So cavitation won't be a problem. There's, it's not a specialty machine. So barring, roll barring is a, a special modulation uh, type fault. Uh, so I've, I've dropped a lot of stuff off. I think I'm down to 23 different faults instead of 35. Okay, so now I can start my sorting. The first uh, sorting mechanism we talked about uh, last Tuesday is the frequency grouping. So we look at all the data we collected. This is uh, positions one, two, three, and four. They're on the bearings, the two motor bearings, the two uh, fan bearings. We're going to take data in the axial, horizontal, and vertical direction. So if I had one of the gauge transducers, I put it on here, it would tell me X, Y, and Z, or axial, horizontal, and vertical at position one, and the same thing at all the other positions. What do I see when I lay them all out? I'm looking for uh, alarm band faults. So we, we've created this little stair step based on the overall level of the machine. Uh, if there's any ind individual peak that crosses that line, uh, we want to know about it, and there's, there's something going on that we're going to have to investigate. For this machine, position three in the vertical direction, I have a high one times RPM. So turning speed of the shaft is 1760. So that's what pops up. It's a little above my alarm level. Uh, I'm going to have to take a look at that. I also have at position four in the vertical direction, that same one times RPM problem, but I have a 4.56 times running speed. I have a non-synchronous frequency in there. Okay, so my uh, two different frequencies of interest are 1760 and 8025. One is synchronous, one is non-synchronous. So I'm going to split those two up. I'm going to first do the analysis on the synchronous frequency and then do the other. So frequency group, uh, this peak at running speed is synchronous. So it's one of these four, eight, nine, ten different things. Okay, uh, we're going to have to have a little more information, uh, consider the directional grouping. So this is radial down here. These are my four radial measurements. It's on the fan. It's uh, at one times RPM and the highest peaks uh, in the vertical direction. Okay. So I can get rid of all the uh, yellow tiles on the table that were bent shaft, angular misalignment, cock bearings, those don't apply anymore because those are all axial problems. So I'm down to five different problems. Okay, now what do I do? I look for the diagnostic that the little uh, tile is telling me to do. So in the upper right-hand corner, there's a, a phase icon. So I have unbalance has a phase problem, uh, diagnostic, so does eccentricity, mechanical looseness type A, and angular offset. Okay. The phase analysis, we'll talk about a little bit. You don't really know, need to know how to do it at this point. Uh, more of an inf informational uh, guide for you. It's structure in using the, the fault periodic table. Uh, so we have a phase test we, that applies to four of our faults, and we have a transient test that applies to natural frequencies. Uh, natural frequencies are considered a synchronous fault. Actually, they're considered any type of fault. Their uh, frequency depends only on mass and stiffness in the system, not rotational speed. So they can be anywhere in the spectrum and cause a problem. So we have to assume that that's a potential problem, do a natural frequency test and make sure either refute it or accept it as uh, the real problem. So we do this, we find out which, which fault is the problem. This one turns out to be mechanical looseness type A. Uh, it defied all the other phase rules for this. So we're down to uh, one fault that fits the bill and we can uh, make our recommendations based on that. The other fault, you remember we had two, uh, we're gonna walk through the same thing. So I consider the design of the machine and we get rid of all the gearbox and belt drive and oil film bearings and DC motor problems and so forth. So we, we're down 35, down to, I think, 23 faults. Same as before. 
Now we're just looking at a different frequency. It's this 8,025 is we take the 8,025 divided by 1760, we get 4.56. So we know it's non-synchronous. Uh, we know it is uh, on the fan bearing and we know it's uh, in the vertical direction. Okay. So frequency group, non-synchronous. Some of them uh, we've gotten rid of already. There's a couple more we can get rid of. Um, pole pass frequency, it has an electrical uh, response that isn't in our spectrum. Should be at 7200, so uh, that one doesn't apply. Uh, electrical line frequency, same thing. Uh, we should see some type of uh, two times line frequency in there. We don't see it, so we get rid of both of those. Uh, turbulent flow uh, is usually subsynchronous, and it looks like a haystack, not a defined peak. Um, bearing natural frequency. Uh, is usually a much higher frequency with sidebands, and the cage frequency is subsynchronous. Okay, so if we get rid of those, we're left with these four potential problems. One, like always, is the natural frequency problem. The other three are the outer race defect, the ball spin, and the inner race defect uh, on the rolling element bearing in position four on our fan. So what do we do? We uh, we Look at for directional type help. Look in there, uh, nothing happened. So uh, it looks like it's probably all a radial problem, but uh, you know we still have to check out the natural frequency for sure. Okay. So we uh, diagnostic test inside each of these icons is the the test that's recommended an ultrasonic uh, analysis. So we pull us an ultrasonic spectrum and look for uh, impacting in the uh, the high frequency spectrum. Uh, and then we also do a transient natural frequency test. So there's our diagnostics. And as it turns out in this case, uh, we found that it was an inner race bearing defect. Okay. Uh, these three will have three specific frequencies that we'll be looking for. If we know the bearing, uh, make, make, uh, model and, um, uh, type vendor, uh, we can uh, determine what all these frequencies are. So two of them didn't pan out. This is the one that fits the fits the mold. So it had a bearing defect and it had a mechanical looseness type A problem. So looseness in that bearing was likely what you know, starts the jackhammer effect and it shows up on the bearing as the bearing starts to fail. Okay. All right, now the new stuff, we're gonna talk about time, amplitude, frequency, and phase. Uh, the key things are amplitude, frequency, and phase. Those are the biggest diagnostic tools. Amplitude is a severity indicator, so it's how much, okay? Here I, in, inside the icon, there's uh, mils, and there's inches per second, and there's Gs. So this is displacement in thousandths of an inch. This is inches per second, it's velocity. This is acceleration in, in Gs. Okay, so this is our first wave. This is uh, how our uh, online transducers work. Uh, they'll be collecting data and collecting data and doing analysis until an alarm is exceeded. So it's our first wave that something has changed and something's uh, impending failure. We're gonna have to figure out what it is before it fails. Uh, frequency, there's Hertz, which is cycles per second. There's orders, so it would be one times, two times, three times, three four or five orders of shaft rotation. So it's just normalized uh, frequency. And CPM and RPM are cycles per minute and revolutions per minute. Frequency is how often the fault occurred or if, you know, if we go from the time waveform to the uh, frequency domain, it's gonna show up as a peak in our spectrum. And that peak is also gonna be alarm criteria, uh, probably as an overall level and as a uh, spectrum band alarm. We'll get a little bit more into that as we go. The last thing is phase analysis. So phase is motion and direction. It's showing us how the machine is moving. And what we're really interested in is uh, usually across couplings. If we have a coupling misalignment in the radial direction, we'll show that radial 180 degrees out of phase response. Kind of like that first animation I showed uh, on the second slide of this presentation. Um, we also look across the machine for bent shafts. We look on the bearings for cocked bearings. So there's there's several things that uh, we can use phase for. 
the, what makes it incredibly useful is there's about 12 different problems that all have the same frequency signature. They show an elevated one times RPM response. So basically everything, uh, if you're looking at the table, uh, everything that's a synchronous problem in the first two columns of the table plus natural frequencies, that can be what we're looking for. We're trying to distinguish all of those things. And phase analysis allows us to do that. And we'll show you how that happens. Okay, oh, in time, time waveform, that's the basic signal. That's where everything starts. And when we talk about time a little bit, um, it includes all the amplitude, all the frequencies, and all the phase information in, in one little package. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it's real simple to look at when you're looking at one frequency and one wiggle in the shaft, uh, but they get awful complicated. So when we go from the uh, the time domain to the frequency domain, it's it's uh, really the way uh, vibration analysis should be done. There's only a couple of problems where we need the time waveform directly uh, to make a diagnosis. The rest of it uh, is in the frequency domain. Um, the overall amplitudes, very trendable. So here we're showing horizontal, vertical, and axial. Uh, assuming this is a, a triaxial transducer, they're all sampled simultaneously, and we'll have three different amplitude trends. Uh, if we need to do an FFT analysis, it looks for the periodic events and calculates the frequencies. Okay, So in this case, they're all uh, rotational speed, probably an unbalanced type problem. Okay, they also have phase. Now, the, the, the Time waveform phase, it's a shift um, indicating a directional motion. To have this shift, we need two different time waveforms to compare. So if uh, we're on the same bearing, uh, we might go from a bearing one to bearing two in the vertical direction. And if they're both moving the same way, then they'll lay on top of each other like this. So one might be higher than the other, but we have basically a zero degrees phase shift if they're moving together. If I have um, a horizontal and a vertical vibration and one on the same bearing, we're looking for an unbalanced effect. Remember, we did that, showed that animation, and we have the red one going past the transducer, and then a quarter of a revolution later, the blue one goes past the transducer. That's a 90 degree phase shift. So we can look directly in our time waveforms and, and see that shift if they're clean enough, obviously. Uh, there's other methods. Uh, we can use a laser tack and compare the uh, heavy spot in the shaft to the laser tack location and see what that is as well. There's a couple different things we'll look at a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, so zero degrees, 90 degrees, this is 180 degrees. So they're moving completely out of phase. So this would be across, um, across the coupling. Basically, this is a misaligned coupling because one half is moving one direction and the other half is moving the other way. They're always fighting each other. Okay, All of these occur at one times RPM or potentially can occur at one times RPM. So unless you had phase, you wouldn't be able to uh, decipher the difference between them. And that's why we use it. So pretty important. OK, we're going to talk about amplitude first. Amplitude um, is how much, it's severity, it's uh, where we, we start off. So the first thing we're going to do when we have one of these transducers installed, and I'm just showing one direction here so that really you're getting X, Y, and Z, and you'll get three trends, is just the time waveform. We'll pull that out. We uh, have some algorithm inside the logic of the transducer that stores the highest amplitude, and that's what we see in our trends. Um, we use this amplitude to set new alarm levels. So this might be an alarm level based on my chart of rules of thumb, uh, 0.35 inches per second when it runs down here somewhere. I don't want to use 0.35 inches per second if I'm running at 0.1 all the time. I want to know how big and how fast it changes uh, from 0.1 to 0.15 or 0.1 to 0.2. If I had this type of alarm on there uh, too highly set, I might miss something like that. So that's the greatest thing about um, doing uh, these transducers to stay 
in one place all the time and they're constantly taking data, there's no human interaction that, to bother them. They get fantastic trends. This would be like January, February, March, April, all that for route-based measurements. You get 12 measurements a year. If I took a measurement every day, I'd get 365 measurements with uh, the in-place uh, wireless transducers. If I took it every hour, I'd have almost 8,800 measurements. Every minute, 300, 350,000, something like that, something ridiculous like that. There is data overload, but you're going to get fantastic trends in this. You'll be able to see real subtle changes uh, that are from plant processes instead of, you know, just motion from uh, month to month, taking the transducer on and off, things like that. Okay, great trends. So amplitude wise, that's what we're, we're doing. Uh, what can these amplitudes be? They can be displacement in mills typically or microns. Uh, there's velocity in inches per second and acceleration in Gs. Those are the units that we prefer, right? Three different types of uh, measurements. Um, this is the one that's preferred, the velocity, and we'll tell you why in a, in a few minutes here. All right, here's my alarm for my machine of interest, 0.325. Uh, I don't wanna wait this long for this thing to creep up to failure. I wanna see it right here maybe where something has changed and I don't know what that is. So we can pick up subtle changes, like I mentioned with the online systems, uh, much faster. Uh, vibration parameters themselves, we just uh, mentioned that we can take displacement velocity or acceleration as our parameter of interest. Now, which one's best? Well, maybe we gotta tell you what they, what they do first. Uh, the displacement is a measure, is usually measured with proximity probes directly on the shaft. Proximity probes are um, usually designed for oil film bearings where there's no rolling elements. And what they'll do, the shaft rides on an oil wedge as it rotates. So what the uh, probes are for, they are inserted through the bearing housing and they come really close within about 50 mils of the shaft, 30 to 50 mils. And they have a magnetic flux that changes with shaft motion. So they're able to detect thousandths of an inch really tiny measurements, tens of thousands. And uh, it, it's real detailed. You can't get that on the housing of a journal bearing. Uh, all the vibrations in the shaft and it has to go through the oil wedge and then the bearing housing and the housings are pretty big and it gets muted out by the time it gets to a, an accelerometer on the housing. So it's really good if you have journal bearings to use displacement with your proximity probes. Um, we use velocity Pretty much, you can, uh, for all vibration measurements on rotating equipment, uh, you can measure it directly with a volometer or something called a seismic uh, velocity transducer, um, but that isn't the easiest method. The volometers are expensive. The seismic transducers are mechanical, so they can fail. The easiest thing to do is integrate that signal mathematically from an accelerometer. So actually, we're, we're taking an acceleration measurement and we're mathematically turning it into velocity. There's very few drawbacks to doing that, except extreme low speed rotating machines. So that's the standard method. Uh, Acceleration is measured directly from an accelerometer transducer. There's a few good reasons to use acceleration, one of which is uh, high speed gearboxes. If you have centrifugal compressors, they have uh, lots of teeth on their high speed shafts and you can get really high uh, gear mesh frequency. And that's one of the limitations of velocity. You don't see those gear mesh frequencies nearly as well. And manufacturing usually quotes um, their alarm levels in acceleration. Okay. okay, we're gonna talk first about amplitude displacement. And this is, uh, a little complicated, but it makes a lot of sense once you see how it goes. And it's a real simple explanation, but it's there's a little story to it. Uh, failure modes from vibration, they come in two methods. One is overload, which is low cycle fatigue, and one is repetitive loading, which is high cycle fatigue. Low, ci low cycle fatigue uh, can usually be designed out, but um, there's something that's changed recently in the power industry. Uh, they're not using um, main coal power plants anymore as 
uh, base load. They're using a lot of them as peaker plants. And you have all these really big pieces of equipment, a lot of uh, force draft and induced draft fans, and they're not made to start and stop. You, you start them and two years later, you turn them off at the outage. But now they're starting and stopping every day. You get a, a, a lot of low cycle fatigue from that big torque and that uh, change in temperature really quick. So the overload capacity, these things really shoot to a high level uh, when you turn them on. There's no soft start. They were never designed for that. And uh, you start to get low cycle fatigue problems. Um, and then you have to start limiting how many times you can do that a, a day or a shift uh, before uh, you're going to cause real big problems. Um, repetitive loading, uh, we're, we get high cycle fatigue. We want to stay under that limit so that it lasts forever. And on our chart, this is called an SN chart, which is uh, stress and cycle diagram. Uh, you can see there's a low cycle fatigue line. There's something called an endurance limit, which is where we want to be um, because if we're on this side of the endurance limit and we're low enough underneath this curve we'll have infinite life okay we're pretty close to that um, so uh, stress res reversals on a log scale so this is cycles and this is amplitude um, we want to be under this curve okay and this is cycle limited frequency limited this is not once you get uh, and the amplitudes below that. So there's a level of dynamic stress that can be tolerated forever, and that's beyond uh, underneath the endurance limit. And that's what we're, we're rooting for here. Uh, did a little uh, fun exercise, and it makes, makes a lot of sense. So what I'm trying to say is displacement amplitude is a function of frequency. And I'm going to show you that it actually is. Here's just a, a paper clip. Okay, we, we can bend it to extreme amplitudes without immediate failure. However, if we apply the loading multiple times, the clip will break after a small number of applications. This is overload or low cycle fatigue due to a dynamic loading. Okay, I take paper clip number one, two, three, four, five, six. I have four bends before it fails, four, five, six, six, eight. So an average of five and a half cycles to fail if I open this up 180 degrees, bring it back, open it up, bring it back. Doesn't take very long to fail. Uh, now, if I open it up to 90 degrees, I get 16, 17, 18, you know, up to 23 cycles. So it averages 19 and a half cycles before it fails. Third one, I go 45 degrees and I even get bigger numbers of cycles. So on average, about 70 cycles to failure. So cycles or frequencies of stress reversals five and a half, 19 and a half, 70. My amplitudes are uh, going down and then cyclic life is going up, okay? So displacement, which that's all this is, I'm bending it a certain, flexing it. Um, 180 degrees, uh, I get a limited lifetime. So I, only, I can only do that five and a half times and then it's gonna fail. So this is my failure line and my displacement failure line. And if I'm uh, if I'm a, a big fan in a power plant and uh, my vibe guy comes to me and says, I have so many mils of vibration, I, I can't do anything with that. He has to tell me what frequency he's talking about so I, so I can gauge what that amplitude is and what it means. If I have five mils of vibration, that's OK here you know, but it's not here. I'm not going to get 70 cycles out of that. It's limited right there. Okay. Uh, the endurance limit is about a million cycles. So in, in mechanical engineering, if you design something to have a cyclic life below a certain threshold, it'll last forever. And that forever number is 10 to the six or a million cycles. So it'd be a million revolutions of a shaft. Okay, and the lower you go, the, the more cyclic life you have. Okay, I have a large induced fan in my power plant. The vibration analyst says the bearing uh, vibration amplitude is five mils or five thousandths of an inch. Is this amplitude acceptable? Can I even answer him? I need a diff an additional piece of information. 
we just learned that displacement vibration is a function of frequency. I need to know what the rotational frequency of the fan is, then I can, I can tell him uh, my answer. Now, part of this answer is the rotational frequency. The other part is my starting point, my velocity. Okay, my velocity in, in inches per second for this type of fan that we have in the power plant, 0.325 inches per second. So I need to calculate how much displacement is equal to 0.325 inches per second. If I stay under this velocity value, I'm going to have infinite life. It'll be um, below my endurance limit. If I go to 0.5 inches per second, I'm above my cyclic limit and it'll fail. Okay, so I want to know is five mils above or below this this limit uh, in velocity. Okay, there's a way to do it with an equation. I don't expect anybody to do this, but this is the relationship that you got to start thinking in your head. Uh, the overall alarm for this class of equipment is 0.325. That's velocity. If the measured vibration is five mils of displacement, and we have a rotational speed of 1790 we can calculate the allowable displacement, okay? And I don't want to do this. So I, I would say, hey, go back and take a velocity measurement. So I don't have to do this every time. And now we can use this 0.325 inches per second. But there are cases where people do this. So we found out that uh, there's 3.47 mils is equal to 0.325 inches per second. So this is the equal displacement for 0.325 inches per second. So the machine's not acceptable. We're running at five mils, we're way above this. Okay, and we're, we're on the bad side of that allowable curve. Now, if, if he said uh, we have uh, eight mils of vibration, I'd have to go back in with the same information and calculate what is the allowable displacement limit based on the velocity for eight mils and find out if that's good or bad. And it's gonna be bad again, okay. Now, this is the roundabout way. Um, I just wanted to tell, get it through your head, this is variable. So the displacement amount isn't enough. You have to tell me what frequency we're talking about so that I know where I am along this curve and what's allowable. So that's kind of tedious. If I use velocity instead, and my velocity is 0.3 inches per second, the stress due to that velocity is going to give me infinite life. If the stress is above roughly 0.3, we'll have finite life. And I say 0.3 because if you look at all the uh, alarm values and the acceptable curves and so forth, 0.3 is like right in the middle. So here's my criteria now. Now, why, why is this important? This flat part of the curve is velocity. It's an energy level. It's not um, related to frequency and it's flat. So if my frequency is 1800 RPM, I have to worry about 0.3 inches per second. If my frequency is 5400 RPM, same thing. I, I, I look at uh, just a threshold level. Okay? It makes it so much simpler. So, you know, it's easy. It's easy to do. You don't want to be calculating a uh, an allowable displacement for every number that comes through. Um, you just go with the velocity uh, kinetic energy um, related alarm value, and it's uh, you get great results. And they've been doing this for a long time. So I, I sorry about the long roundabout way of explaining this, but that's what people still don't quite get in their heads when they quote the displacement values. You have to know what frequency it is to see where you are and how many, what amplitude you can tolerate. Okay. Um, now, acceleration has the same type of problem. There's an acceleration or a, an inertial force generated will increase with speed and will be a function of frequency. The uh, centrifugal force, the unbalanced force, there's a, a mass offset and there's a radius offset of that mass and there's RPM in here, and it's RPM squared, actually. So it's it's even a little more nonlinear. Um, but this is the path it follows. It, it opposes the displacement path that we talked about earlier. They almost meet in the middle. It's a little off, and I'll show you that in a sec, but this is the trend. So if I'm quoting things in uh, acceleration, let's say I have uh, 12 Gs, 
is that good or bad? I have to go, you have to tell me what frequency we're talking about. I have to calculate an equivalent velocity level and see if that's good or bad. So uh, it's tedious. You can't, you, so you really don't want to use acceleration and you don't want to use displacement unless you're, you know, proximity probe where you're measuring it directly. You want to use velocity. It's great over a, a broad range of frequencies and it's a very simple uh, alarm criteria. Here's what's called the contour of equal severity. Um, this is the velocity measurement. So I have it from two Hertz up to 10,000 Hertz. It's pretty flat all the way across there. These are the equivalent displacement for this value of vibration. So if this is 0.3 inches per second at 10 Hertz, the equivalent displacement limit is 10 mils. Okay, the equivalent velocity limit but at that 10 hertz is 0.07 uh, Gs. So I, 0.07 Gs doesn't mean anything to me. 10 mils doesn't mean anything to me unless I know for sure what the um, frequency is. It's so much easier just to use the velocity as a across the board severi severity limit. <clears throat> Okay, so reinforcing the point, this is the best alarm parameter is velocity due to its flat response and its independence of frequency. And when we're looking at amplitudes, uh, here's the something I brought up on Tuesday. Uh, I'll do a little more of this uh, next Tuesday, uh, but this is some sampling and some statistics on just four days of data uh, from a power plant. So this was a big vertical pump. Um, I have uh, a bunch of statistics in here working on this, but I'm looking for an alarm criteria. And what I have is uh, a value that's changing that the more data I get. As I'm taking data, I'm adding to my statistical population. And once I get out here four days later, my alarms have criteria has gone down here and it's squeezed in there. And by the way, I do want to have alarms in both directions. Th these alarms are set by uh, a mean plus three sigma distribution. So the mean value, the average value, plus or minus three standard deviations. And that's what gives me these, these curves on either side. The top one, I, obviously I want to know if vibration goes up, I want to be able to detect that. But also I want to detect if vibration goes down. If I go from, um, 0.175 inches per second, and I drop down to 0.1, something something changed, something happened. It might not be good. You know, usually a low vibration is good, but maybe it's the, the machine turned off. It shut down for some reason. And now I, I'm not taking any data. It's flat. And sometimes that happens. And you'll run uh, a machine or you'll have non-operating machine and you won't know it until something else uh, tells you. Okay. Oh, the other thing, we can trend more than one parameter. Okay. I mentioned uh, earlier the, the GRACE nodes, they have a triaxial MEMS accelerometer in them. Uh, two of those axes, the um, X and Y directions, uh, I believe the frequency range is a thousand hertz. Uh, the third direction they're starting to change out those and make that, uh, I think, an 8,000 or 9,000 uh, CPM or Hertz uh, signal. So they're going to have better capability in the transducers they currently have. They're going to be able to monitor the X, Y, and Z low frequency range. Plus, they can do some, some sampling and uh, bandwidth filtering to be able to get the really high frequency usefulness out of them. So five kilohertz up to eight kilohertz or whatever the limit is on these. So that's a nice uh, nice development way to go. Um, this is the severity chart, the amplitude parameter severity, bearing health for rolling element bearing machines. Oh man, I am uh, i didn't get through nearly as much as I wanted to today. Um, so this severity parameters, we, we already talked a little bit about the walkthrough. I just noticed it's almost 11 o'clock. Um, I will try to fill in uh, just a minute. Uh, amplitude parameters, there's uh, severity here. This is another suggestion. 
um, there's different frequencies that are bound to show up based on the design of the machine. So there's one times RPM, there's blade pass frequency, there's gear mesh frequency. Um, you're popping up a packet of overall energy information from this chart, basically, uh, every second, you, every time you collect data off your machine. And it comes up as a kilobyte package or whatever into the cloud. Uh, there is a way you can probably do that with each frequency you're interested in. So this is one, two, and three times harmonics. There's subsynchronous. There's blade pass. If you know what the bearing is, you can put those values in and upload just that uh, tight frequency band instead of the whole spectrum. I believe the spectrum's calculated originally, and then if you just filter off different sections, you can get all kinds of statistical information on discrete frequencies in the spectrum. Good morning. My name is Dan Ambright. This is uh, the third installment of three uh, different uh, setups on uh, webinar for um, Grace Engineered Products, uh, Introduction to Vibration Analysis. And thank you for joining us. I see there's over 300 people that are already on the line. Uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, this is the third installment so if uh, there's something that you see in this one, I might brush past it a little bit faster on one of my reviews. Uh, you can go back to that first seminar in uh, uh, last Tuesday and see a really good overview of everything. Um, I just hate to be redundant on every succe succeeding uh, webinar, or at least I feel I'm redundant, and I'd rather get into a little more information. But um, and also, uh, if you please recognize that this is normally a, a two-day class. So I'm taking 16 hours and turning it into three. So there's a, a lot that you will miss. I mean, this is just a brief overview of everything just to get you oriented to uh, vibration. You might might be able to answer a question or two from your, uh, from your vendors or your salespeople, but um, you won't obviously won't know everything about vibration. I've been doing this for 30 years and I still see things monthly that surprise me. Um, but anyway, uh, full spectrum diagnostics, we do training and certification, uh, live training, AS and T and ISO based uh, guidelines. We also have a lot of interactive stuff. So I've been doing these uh, webinar short courses. And then I also have an online learning management system software uh, that takes subscriptions for uh, on, on your own learning or learn on your own time, basically. Um, and they're used as troubleshooting or as formal teaching. It doesn't uh, either way. Um, the, what you see on the screen is the vibration fault periodic table. We'll, we'll touch on uh, the various aspects of it today. Um, it is the backbone. It's the framework structure for learning vibration, I believe, but also doing analysis where you can walk through and uh, slowly eliminate problems by uh, frequency content, by directional response, and then uh, zero in on the root cause. Okay. Uh, we also have a machinery analysis division. Uh, we specialize in some high-end machinery animation um, analysis called experimental modal analysis, which is a frequency analysis for natural frequencies. Uh, we also have operating deflection shape uh, analysis of machinery. And the end product of it is something that can be usable and understandable by uh, anybody. And the, the unit you're looking to here, looking at right now, on this side, there's a steam turbine there's a gearbox uh, with couplings on both sides and you're coupled up to a generator. And this was one of the actual problems that we solved. There are probably three, 400 measurements here, uh, physical measurements we had to put down, but you can see right away, there's thrusting across this coupling. There's nothing on this side. This coupling is running beautifully, but we're thrusting this coupling and we're pitching the generator a little bit. So there's a, a couple of problems that we can see right away. Um, and you might not know anything about vibration, but it makes total sense to see the motion. And this is a phase analysis, kind of phase on steroids. And we'll, we'll get a little bit more into phase analysis uh, in this section today. Um, the third uh, little division we have is uh, Emmyscope ODS video. So instead of taking physical measurements, we take a high speed video. Uh, the clip is processed. It, we enhance the displacements and rescale the amplitudes and we can see uh, what can't be seen uh, visually. So there's something like 1.3 million pixels in each one of these images. 
potentially we could use all those pixels. We only use about 10% right now to get a, a incredible view of what's actually going on. Uh, so today's analysis uh, or instruction, uh, introduction to vibration analysis part three is gonna uh, have a quick overview of the PDM process. Uh, we're gonna have a look at the vibration fault periodic table and do an overview of that. So it's described as a logical sorting mechanism providing an analysis framework and methodology. And the whole idea is to eliminate faults until you get down to the root cause. Um, we're gonna look at basic, basic vibration analysis that we started last time and we ended up, uh, had to cut it a little short. We were in the amplitude phase of it and we're gonna look at frequency and phase analysis today. Uh, and then the last section is ultrasonic vibration analysis and trending. This is how rolling element variants fail. Uh, up to now, we've been talking about basically trending the overall energy in the machine uh, from the grace transducers sitting on top of the machine, and we're not really picking up a frequency analysis. Uh, we're going to talk about frequency analysis. We can do that on demand if we wish. It's just a power consumption issue, so we don't do it all the time, but we're trending the overall level. Okay? The ultrasonic vibration analysis is another measurement. It's a high frequency filtered measurement. And this is how rolling element bearings fail. Uh, if you have other problems like looseness, misalignment, bent shaft, cock bearings, things like that, they'll fail at turning speed of the shaft. So they have a particular frequency group that you're dealing with. The ultrasonics, they'll fail at a frequency hundreds of times higher out in the ultrasonic range. So we're going to look at uh, briefly at what that ultrasonic vibration is and how we can use it to trend um, the output of the grace transducer. Okay, the overview, the very basics, we have the machine of interest. So we're going to choose a machine and uh, knowing the machine is important uh, when you're setting up your database because each machine has a different allowable vibration level uh, based on by design. Okay, um, they're not all the same. We're going to put our transducer on it. This is a calibrated transducer. You see something like 100 millivolts per G. That's typical. That will give us a, a value that means something. So the analog voltage output is voltage versus time. When we uh, put this calibration factor in, we get uh, uh, acceleration versus time. So it's millivolts per G. So we get acceleration as our amplitude, time as our axis, and we have a usable signal. Well, not quite. The analog signal's infinite, okay? It's, it goes on and on. We can't process something like this. It would take us forever. Instead, we digitize it and sample it at a very high rate. So we can see all the, uh, the dots here. And the dots are so close together, they look like lines when you're done. So you're basically turning this into a bunch of dots that are equally spaced so you don't lose any of the important information you're after. Okay. And so it mimics the signal and it sets it up for doing the FFT process. The FFT processor, Fast Fourier Transform, strips out all the individual periodic events out of the complicated signal. So we have this complicated time waveform with lots of wiggles in it. Each one of those wiggles corresponds to something. It's if you overlay them all, they're the periodic, all the periodic events inside that uh, trace. Uh, the FFT processor finds the subtle uh, low frequency period. It finds the more dominant second period in here. And then there's a third higher frequency period involved. Okay. Not real important how it does it specifically, but that's the, the easy thing. So I can use a, a very simple mathematical equation. Frequency equals one divided by the period. If I know this period length and it took uh, half a second or something to do that, uh, one divided by 0.5 is two hertz or two cycles per second. Okay, So I have a frequency. I can do the same for all these. If I know how long this periodic event was, I can calculate the frequency it generates. So now I go from a time waveform or a time domain to a frequency domain. Okay, The only thing left out is how much is too much. Uh, F2 looks like it's the biggest peak, but we don't know exactly what F2 is. We go in here and we look at our machine. We uh, get a strobe light out. We get a laser. We do something. We find out what the speed of the machine is. 
and we find out the speed is 1760. So F2 is my running speed, my turning speed of the shaft. F1 is something below running speed, and F3 is some frequency we haven't determined yet. If I know where one times RPM is, I can make my stair step pattern. And this uh, we talked about a little bit, uh, I think, uh, last Thursday. The stair step pattern is giving me alarms on each frequency band. Okay, so I have a whole series of alarms now. We'll get a little more into that. So we're answering the question, how much is too much? So if any one of these bands produces an amplitude that's uh, above our limit, like this one or this one, we can go in and do some analysis and figure out what's causing that and how we can deal with it. Uh, the vibration fault periodic table, it's a structure and method. It's a, a sorting mechanism. Uh, it has different three different uh, steps, basically. First is uh, we're going to sort the vibration by frequency content. So there's synchronous, harmonic, subsynchronous, non-synchronous, and modulation. These are all the columns on the tables. The second part of this, it's organized by directional response. These are the colors, the yellow, the red, and the orange. And after we're done sorting those two uh, times, we organize our faults by a diagnostic. So we have five different diagnostics we can do just to uh, sort out what's what. So in this case, if I think it's in a, a, a synchronous column, I have a bunch of phase diagnostics I would do, okay, to see which one of these faults is the, is the culprit. Um, if it's in over here in a non-synchronous range, I might use an ultrasonic or a transient or an oil uh, orbit analysis uh, to figure out the problem. Okay, so we're all working our way toward the root cause. The various components, uh, synchronous is one times RPM or turning speed of the shaft, okay? Rotating speed of the motor and pump and what have you, okay? That's one times RPM. Everything in these two columns produces a one times RPM. They're very similar, okay? This is the only one little oddball. This is going to appear everywhere. The natural frequency is not a, a, it's a frequency based on mass and stiffness. So it's not based on some you know, blades or gears or anything like that. It is all mass and stiffness. Uh, we have to disprove that in a concur, it can occur anywhere. It's non-synchronous, but it can be close to running speed and still amplify. So we have to prove down the road here if uh, this is a problem or if it's a phase problem. Uh, in the third part of the analysis. So the first uh, two columns are synchronous, uh, turning speed of the shaft. Uh, there is a little bit of overlap, but the three columns, uh, columns two, three, and four are harmonics. So they're exact multiples of running speed. And the easiest way to understand this is if I have 53 teeth on my gear, I'm gonna get 53 times running speed, exactly 53. In every tooth that engages, I get a little bit of a pulse. So every revolution of the shaft, I get a pulse per tooth. So 53 teeth. If I have uh, a pump with five blades, I'm going to get exactly five times running speed. And it's a pulsation in pumps and fans and compressors when a uh, fluid is compressed past an obstruction. So in a pump, it's a cut water You'll get, uh, you'll squeeze that uh, fluid, whatever it is, and it'll pulse as each blade goes by that cut water. Um, so I guess might as well use the last one too. In electric motors, AC induction motors, you have rotor bars, and they're part of the design of the motor, but they uh, switch back and forth from positive to negative polarity. Um, so it's important to know if your that sequence is working properly. Uh, you'll have a, a, an exact number of rotor bars. So it'll be 48 rotor bars and you'll see a 48 times running speed pulsation. Okay, so synchronous, harmonic. Uh, my next grouping is subsynchronous and it's less than shaft turning speed. So below running speed of the shaft. Um, Non-synchronous faults are basically anti-harmonic faults. They're not equal to multiples of shaft speed. They might be 5.12, they're not five times running speed, they're not six times running speed, they're actually a fraction, 5.125, let's say, times running speed, okay? They're easy to recognize in the spectrum when you compare them to the turning speed of the shaft. Uh, the last is modulation type faults. It's a pulsing combination. 
So the beat frequency or uh, something that generates sidebands in the spectrum. And we have several um, examples of that coming up. So we'll, we'll cover that pretty well. Okay, so there is the vibration fault periodic table. We do a sort by frequency. We do a, a sort by uh, or directional response. In this case, that's the colors. And I'll show you that right now. If uh, you see a radial response in your machine, then that's the red blocks. Okay, that means that axial is in a dominant direction. We can eliminate it. If you see axial is a dominant response, all the radial ones go away. Okay. If you uh, see orange, or if you have a radial or axial response, it'll be an orange fault on the block. And these are usually by design. So if, uh, a good example of that is a, a gearbox in the, the, the gear design. If it's a spur gear, it's more radial. If it's a herringbone, there's a, there'll be an axial component. So the, the overall vibration could be either one of those. Okay. And lastly, we have the diagnostics, the phase, time, waveform, orbits, transients, and ultrasonics. Um, and we these are inside each box. So let's say I uh, have a synchronous fault. It's radial directed, my dominant direction. I'm going to have these four blocks. And they all have a phase icon in there. So there's a phase test that I can do for each to prove or disprove each one of those. Okay, and that's how the diagnostic works. So two sorting mechanisms, frequency group and directional response. And then the icons themselves are telling us what to do next and how to narrow it down. Um, thinking like a vibration analyst, this is kind of how the process works. And it, it's evolving, okay? All this um, wireless transducers and cloud data and uh, AI systems um, there's going to be a little bit of time before it's perfect, but this is the kind of the, the stretch we're looking for. Okay, we're acquiring data. We're, we're doing overall trends. We're doing time waveforms and spectrum at selected positions on the machine. Minimum, we want to have a, a grace transducer. They're triaxials. We'll put one on motor outboard, motor inboard, pump inboard, pump outboard. Okay, basically at every bearing. You want an X, Y, and Z response. So what you'll get is 12 measurements. The top block here are the overall levels, and that's primarily what we're sensing. We're looking for overall levels. We're checking for changes, something to go in alarm. And once that happens, let's say we're the, there it is, we're the block here and we get into the alarm range, then we're on demand going to say, hey, we need to capture a time waveform. We need to capture a spectrum. We need to review that and see if there's any alarms in that uh, uh, spectrum. Okay. We can also pull in plant process parameters, uh, pump curves, fan curves that might be um, something that uh, we can pick out that's useful in there, where we're operating on the curve when something like this happens and we get a high vibration. So it might just be an operational problem. The best efficiency point is right there where you'd have minimum vibration. You stray away from that on a pump and you'll either cavitate or recirculate and the vibration levels will go up. So if we can integrate those plant processes, it's fantastic. Uh, this one is something that uh, Grace is working on. This is phase analysis. So we can look on the same transducer from X, Y, and Z's to see what the, the dominant response and the phase response is. But the real power in that is having the transducers talk to themselves. So I have four different transducers. There's a way that we're uh, working on to sync all the clocks so that they all capture data exactly simultaneously and we get a good phase measurement. If that turns out, we can animate something like that and get a, you know, a rough animation, but something that's gonna tell us how the machine's moving. And that's part of the, this process to help us uh, figure the underlying faults. Um, determine potential faults, update the rule base. You know, here I show that there's a, an alignment issue, a looseness issue, and a, a blade passing issue. So those are things that might not be an alarm yet, but they're things we can trend. So instead of just trending overall vibration, we might be able to trend the phase response, which is how, how the machine's moving, when did it start, how bad is it getting, and so forth. So we have a degree of uh, analysis there. Then we acquire data all over again. 
So if we do this process over and over, every hour, every minute, what have you, we'll get incredible trends that we can uh, then use to our benefit and extend the life of the machines. Okay, from uh, yep, the last Thursday, uh, we did some looking into the real basics, the time, amplitude, frequency, and phase, and they're all interrelated in many ways. Uh, the time waveform signal is the basic signal that we get. It's the first thing coming out of the transducer. We can turn it into a spectrum, but um, most of the time we're extracting a peak value out of it and passing that value on. Okay, so we're going to get an amplitude uh, out of it. Uh, we can trend that uh, velocity signal coming out, but we can also trend, we'll, we'll find out in a few minutes, the ultrasonic end of that as well. Um, so the time we're going to look at in a second here. Amplitude is um, in different units, mils and inches per second or Gs. The dominant uh, response parameter that we want to look at is velocity in inches per second. Uh, frequency, that's up to you how you like to look at your data. Usually people, it's either hertz or CPM, so cycles per minute or cycles per second. You can also normalize your data and look at it in orders if you wish. Amplitude is how much. It's the severity parameter. Frequency is how often. So it gives us a, a look at what the source of that response, that amplitude change is when we go into the frequency domain. And the last is phase. And phase tells us motion and direction. And there's uh, seven different phase rules that we can apply to understand how the machine's moving. And they're all independent of each other. So one of them might say a bent shaft, the other might say a cock bearing, okay? And very interesting technology, and, and it's visual. So everybody can understand once a phase analysis is done. So we'll get into that. Time waveform, the basic signal, first analysis parameter. Time waveform includes all amplitude and frequency and, and phase, uh, sort of. We'll get there in a second. Uh, the overall amplitude is very trendable. So what we're seeing here is the output of a triaxial accelerometer. So we have horizontal, vertical, and axial uh, simultaneously. The interesting feature as far, as far as what we're concerned with right now is tracking the, the amplitude. So I have an amplitude in, in horizontal amplitude, vertical amplitude, axial amplitude. And I'll have three different trend lines that I can run statistics on. I can also calculate the frequency. Okay. And we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but the frequency um, won't be a parameter that we're interested in until uh, there's some amplitude uh, excursion telling us that there's a problem. Then on demand or, or uh, by default, we can calculate the frequency content of the, of the signals coming out of this and get a little deeper in depth. Okay, but right now it's just the amplitudes uh, trending uh, give us a really good idea. And... X, Y, and Z in, all, in, in the bearings is the best possible way to go. Um, there is phase information. And like I mentioned, uh, you can do this manually or you can do it eventually if we can uh, sync all the transducers. And the best idea of phase is looking across the coupling. So let's say I'm looking across the coupling uh, there's been an amplitude change. We go and look at the two different grace transducers that are talking to each other, and we note that the phase, they're in phase with each other. Okay, Their time waveforms lay on top of each other. They're not shifted. Okay? That would say that the uh, coupling's in phase, and it must be something else, or not misaligned. If we see something like this, we see a 180-degree phase shift our tabs are uh, completely out of phase with each other. And if we look at the time waveform, the waveforms are 180 degrees out of phase, okay? So that's saying, yes, we might have a coupling misalignment. The third one is what we'd see in an unbalanced condition, whether it's residual unbalance or it's a, a faulty unbalance, we're going to see a 90 degree phase shift between vertical, vertical and horizontal. Okay, that 90 degree phase shift is the transducer or the heavy spot has to go 90 degrees further from horizontal to vertical to be uh, crossing the transducer. So now we see this, this out of phase time shift. Those are the three important frequencies or the phase definitions that we're looking at. Either it's in phase, it's a 90 degree shift, or it's out of phase. That's going to allow us to uh, distinguish about eight different faults. Uh, 
uh, amplitude wise, how much? Uh, we talked a briefly about this uh, last Thursday. Uh, I'm logging the amplitude. And so I got one little leader here and I'm waiting for it to go into alarm, okay? What is this alarm level? It's based on the machine. So I have a, a center hung direct coupled um, fan or blower system. My alarm level is going to be 0.325 inches per second. So here we're, we're using velocity. That's where my alarm line is. Okay. And we'll start trending. Once we know the machine, we know uh, what rough estimate of what the alarm levels are going to be. Uh, now these are much more meaningful. Now, this is just January through December. This would be a route like measurement. Uh, walk around routes, you take your data every month, you log it into the database, and you get something sparse like this. If you're using a wireless transducer, you can command it to do it once a day. You can take data once an hour, what have you. So let's say we're taking it once an hour, and in a month, that's a lot of data points. You can see two different trends here. You can see a flat response going through here, and then you see a jump. And then maybe another trend like this. So two different slopes, but you see a jump right here. Uh, this is from month to month. That could just be slight misplacement of the transducer before you take your data um, or many other things. But if you're a, a, a transducer that's uh, magnetically mounted to the machine and staying put all the time, you don't have any of that manipulation. This might be actually some type of fault that uh, popped up that's very subtle that we'll be able to get when we start filling in these dots with more data. So even though we're not getting a lot of frequency information or any frequency information until we do a spectrum. The amplitude's got a lot of stories to tell. So we'll, we'll uh, worry about that a little bit. We can take our data and set our alarms or whatever in displacement, uh, in velocity, or in acceleration. The next couple examples are going to explain why we're going to use velocity. Velocity is a very flat severity uh, parameter and it, it goes across a really big frequency range, okay? Uh, my pay-per-click uh, example about displacement last time, this is a, a S, SN curve, which is a stress versus cycles uh, failure curve that's used in metallurgy and uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, why is it of interest to us? Because we can have low cycle failures uh, where we get large displacements, but very low number of cycles and we can have high, high cycle fatigue failures where they have extremely long lifetimes. And it all depends on the amplitude. If we're doing a displacement amplitude, uh, it's a function of frequency. And I can prove that with my uh, paperclip example. I'll do 180 degrees of displacement and I'll go back and forth until uh, I fail that paperclip and it's about five and a half cycles, okay? So I did it six times for each one of these. So five and a half cycles is failure for a displacement of 180 degrees. So I plot that on my line. Okay, I don't know what the exact value is. I'd need a strain gauge, but do the same thing at a 90 degree bend. It takes much higher cycles to fail. So uh, over three times uh, longer it lasts, but it's allowable is a little lower. Okay, 19.5 cycles my amplitude of displacement was half of what I was over here. And the, and the third example is I have a 45 degree bend and I bend that back and forth 45 degrees and I get about 70 cycles. This is telling me my displacement amplitude is a function of frequency, function of number of cycles, okay? So if I am asked uh, is five mils uh, an acceptable vibration level, an acceptable displacement level, I, I can't tell you what that answer is. I would have to know what frequency we're talking about so that I could actually calculate where that falls, that five mil falls with respect to this allowable curve, okay? Uh, maybe uh, a little better example is uh, low frequency limitations of overshoot. When you uh, turn on an electric motor, unless you have a, a soft start on it, uh, it'll pulse pretty good. You'll get a good overshoot uh, where you've you've gone beyond the uh, limit that you want to go, the tolerance limits. It'll settle back down and it'll run nice. Most fossil plants 
uh, have baseload capability, and that's what they're designed for. A baseload meaning that you turn them on and you won't turn that thing off for six months to a year, okay? Unless there's some type of problem that you have to fix. Um, people design for that. So for a baseload plant, uh, you might say, well, we can plan on having one start and stop cycle every month. So for 20 years, that's 240 cycles. And I can plot that on my LCF curve. So I can say, there's my max. I don't want to run anywhere above that. Well, now these plants are starting to use as peaker units. So natural gas plants are taking more of a baseload capability. Um, they're turning on and off uh, fans in fossil plants to uh, adjust for load. What does that do? We still have, every time we start or stop, we still have the same amplitude. We're not following that allowable curve anymore. So we'd have... Uh, four times uh, as much, as many starts. So 960 starts. So instead of 20, life, 20 years of life, we'll get five years of life. If we do that every day, we get a ridiculous amount of starts and stops. 7,300, that's about seven to eight months of operating. Okay, So that we're, we haven't started seeing it yet, but the peaker type on off stuff is going to be a big fatigue factor for uh, big AC induction motors. Okay. And we can see how displacement amplitude is a function of frequency with this example as well. Okay, velocity. The velocity parameters analogous to kinetic energy makes it relatively independent of frequency response. So if I suggest uh, a, an alarm level of velocity, it's basically based on what I choose for my piece of equipment. So if I have a horizontal pump, my uh, value is 0.29 inches per second. So if I operate below 0.29 inches per second, I'll have infinite life. Okay, doesn't matter what frequency, it's flat across the frequency range. There's no slope to that line. If I operate above 0.3 inches per second or above 0.29, I'm going to have finite life. I have eventually it's going to fail. So that's my alarm level. If I can stay lower than that. Um, I'll have better outcomes on my machinery. Okay. The last parameter is acceleration and it's inertial force. So it's a centrifugal force that's generated from an unbalanced shaft. Uh, there's an equation for that. We don't know how, need to know how this works, but it's the mass offset. What radius is that offset uh, times RPM divided by a thousand squared. RPM is in there, meaning that it's changing with speed. Actually, it's changing with speed squared but you get a curve that looks like this now. This is the displacement curve going this way. This is the acceleration curve going that way. Okay, so same sort of deal. Is 1G bad? 1G would be horrendous over here, but up here you wouldn't even feel it. So the, it's uh, acceleration is a function of speed as well, or a function of frequency. Which brings me to the chart that kind of sums it up. This is, um, what's called a contours of equal severity chart. Okay, we show velocity, we show uh, relative displacement to that velocity, and we show relative acceleration to that velocity. We can choose any parameter we want, but when it all comes down to it, if I have a point that's right there that's 10 mils, I have to know what frequency it is. Um, and if it's at 10 hertz, then I can calculate an equivalent velocity and see if I'm above or below that line. Okay. Uh, there's no curve to, it, it'd be tables worth of data to be able to uh, do it for any um, amplitude level. So all you have to really remember is velocity is flat. There's no slope to it. It doesn't, uh, it's independent of frequency. It's not uh, having, it doesn't have any limitation on that. So from low frequency to high frequency, all we have to know is what that alarm limit is in the frequency domain. All right, so we're, we're having a couple parameters, and I, we, we've been talking around this the last couple of uh, seminars, webinars. Um, this is uh, about four days worth of data and phenomenal trend changes. Amplitudes are very simple, uh, mean plus three sigma vibration, and what that means is uh, the mean vibration plus or minus three standard deviations from that mean, and we can have lots of different statistical alarms on this.
and it's constantly updating because you're constantly grabbing data. This was once every hour for four days, and I can see a change in my alarm levels, which is pretty impressive. Um, there's another uh, parameter down here. This is velocity for, um, for my main trend that I'm looking at. This is high frequency acceleration, and it's a filtered measurement that we'll get into shortly. That's, this one's called peak view, but it's a uh, high frequency energy. Okay? All you're doing is filtering out the low frequency. You're using the same time signal that you've used before. It's just filtered a different way, and you're looking for the high frequency end uh, faults instead of the low frequency. And all that can be trended as well. Very good rolling element bearing um, parameter for detecting those types of problems. Um, so along with the time waveform, which we're seeing basically the, the peaks from the time waveform, we can also do a frequency response for more diagnostic purposes. But the way that the, the node captures data, we don't need to capture the entire spectrum to make it useful. We can capture peaks in different frequency ranges. So we can specify the one times RPM range or the subsynchronous or the harmonic ranges of interest. And we can pull a value off of that and trend each of those values. So the, the, the database setup is, is always changing and it's, it's got some really good capability. You just have to have some ideas on how to do the statistics. This, is, this would be what this is like. So I have a bin for my one times RPM and that's, you know, Basically, I can put a, do a spectrum, put a filter on one times RPM, and pull that value off. I can also do it for blade passing, for bearing frequencies, for gear meshing, uh, all the different things in here. If I know the bearings themselves, what make and model number it is, I can put a very narrow band in there and look for these frequencies to appear. And it's very subtle stuff in the, in the background noise, and it'd be very, very... Um, very interesting to pull those out statistically, which shouldn't be too bad. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the frequency now, uh, how often something happens. There's a lot of sources, and when you think about it, I have a uh, direct coupled um, center hung fan and overhung fan over here, but same deal. Subsynchronous frequencies. The rolling element bearings can cause subsynchronous. The isolation system, the springs that the, the structure's on, can uh, bounce and cause a low frequency vibration that's subsynchronous. Synchronous is shaft speed, turning speed of the shaft. Harmonics are from misalignment, looseness, blades, and gears. Uh, non synchronous frequencies come out as belt frequencies, electrical uh, resonance, and rolling element bearings. And modulation comes from electrical problems, gears, and, and bearing problems. Okay. If we're only looking at the time waveform, we're not seeing the frequency content. We're not seeing the individual peaks in the spectrum that, and seeing what percentage of each peak is, is adding to the problem. But we can calculate it. So the way to probably do this would be on demand or at the beginning or end of a run cycle, uh, capture a full spectrum and you know, store it in the database. Otherwise, you can continue on with uh, just the amplitude levels, okay, the overall amplitudes. But as we talked the other days uh, of this series, how do you calculate a frequency from a time waveform? You have to know the, the encapsulate the entire period in time. So we start here, we go to a negative maximum, we go to a positive maximum, and then we go back to zero and repeat. If we know that periodic event, Frequencies one over the period. If it took uh, two seconds, then it's one over two. It's half a hertz. Okay, pretty easy calculation. Real easy for uh, the FFT processor as well. Okay, frequency content. We're going to do this real quick. Subsynchronous faults, or excuse me, synchronous faults are at one times RPM. Uh, the label on the pump or on the sorry on the motor uh, the nameplate data is probably going to tell us roughly what the the low unloaded uh, speed of the motor is when it came out of the shop that built it okay yours is going to be a little bit different because you're hooked up to another machine so there'll be some load on it so it might slow it down a little bit the best way of knowing how fast your machine is turning 
is to stro- use a strobe light, use a laser tack, um, or go in with a high resolution um, spectrum and actually measure it. Right? So in this case, 1784 is my turning speed of the shaft. Um, if I have a fault at one times or very close to one times, as in any case, this is the mundane um, way to do it. But if my fault's at 1784, my speed's at 1784, I divide them, I get one times RPM. Okay, so synchronous fault. Harmonic faults are multiples of turning speed. Okay, so I have to know how does this peak relate to that peak? 10,704, when I put my cursor on it, I divide by 1784, I get exactly six. So this is six blades on a fan or uh, six blades in a pump, what have you, right? So we have uh, an exact multiple of turning speed. Subsynchronous faults are below running speed. We have a peak here that's below turning speed. We put our cursor on it divide it by running speed, we get 0.419 times running speed. So it's about 40, uh, 42% of running speed, subsynchronous. Non-synchronous peaks are not multiples of running speed. I got a peak here at 5441, I divide it by running speed, I get 3.049 times running speed, not three times, not four times, it's not a whole number. That's why we take it out to a couple of uh, digits out here. Um, there's three times. Here's my harmonic cursor, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth. There's my three times running speed. This is at 3.049. So it's non-synchronous. It's probably a bearing defect. Okay? You need a spectrum to be able to pick that out. Modulation events. I think I did a, an exa- a different example last time, but a modulation event is a series of peaks. That are equally spaced. So there's a center frequency, which I have in green. If I go and divide that by running speed, I get 27 times. So 27 of something. And if this was on a motor, so it's probably 27 rotor bars in the motor, a whole number. Okay. If I do the same thing, I divide all these other peaks out, I'm getting some weird numbers. They're not 26, 25, you know, so it's not a one times RPM spacing. Uh, that's how some uh, rolling element bearings fail. They'll have, they'll modulate at one times RPM. This is modulating at an electrical frequency. This is 120 Hertz or you multiply it by 60, it's 7,200 CPM is a, telling me that there's a rotor bar p- pass problem in my motor, okay? You don't really need to diagnose it to that extent. I'm just trying to get you an idea of there's a center frequency and there's a spacing on the side bands and the spacing is telling you the source, okay, and how it's modulating. So that's one type of modulation fault. Um, The last uh, little tidbit for our um, uh, analysis here of time, amplitude, frequency, and phase is phase is motion and direction. It's telling us uh, how that piece of machinery is moving that's going to be you know, one of the six or seven phase tests that we perform, and it's going to narrow down the response, and we'll be able to pick out the root cause. Uh, on the table, these are the phase diagnostic um, icons. This is the group. So it's mostly synchronous problems, right, in one natural frequency. It, this gear problem doesn't uh, play into it. So there's uh, three, five, uh, 10. There's 10 different phase type problems here that we'll have to dig into. They all have the same spectrum. They all have a dominant one times RPM, possibly a two times RPM harmonic, and they look enough alike that we can't tell one from the other. Okay, So if we don't do phase analysis, we're not going to be able to uh, define any of those problems. Visually, gives you a better idea This is offset angular or angular misalignment. I have my uh, analysis I've done across the coupling in the axial direction and they're 180 degrees out of phase. I do that same thing in the vertical direction and they're 180 degrees out of phase. This is an offset misalignment, either horizontal or vertical, depending on the direction, okay? 
phase. Uh, it's how the system is vibrating defined as the relative motion to a fixed reference, like a laser, a relative motion to a rotating reference uh, uh, measured in angular degrees. The main and full phase numbers are zero degrees, 90 degrees, and 180. It's the forces in the machine that are making it uh, correct and push back and forth. Okay, so if we can figure out phase-wise how the machine's moving, we're going to be able to decipher the problem. Uh, how's it done? Uh, real rough, real rough idea of how it's done. We rove the transducer. We have a piece of reflective tape on the sh on the shaft somewhere that's giving me a, a position reference. That tack is hooked up, and I look at the the transducer output and the tack output on the same scale, and I can see that one rotation every time it rotates in into uh, view of that uh, reflective tape, I get a pulse. Every time the heavy spot goes by, I get a pulse. So if I know the distance between that tack and that and that pulsing, and I can uh, equate it to phase, I can see what angle my heavy spot is. Okay. But even even better, this is that's more for balancing. Even better for a phase diagnostic, uh, my tack is at a single position and doesn't move. Everything's relative. Every phase measurement I make is relative to that tax uh, that tack location. So I can make little tick marks of I leave the tack where it is. I put my transducer in a different spot and this waveform is going to shift around. So it'll tell me a different phase number for each location. You really have to do it live. Um, and in the vibration um, introduction to vibration class, we have a motor demonstrator. We go and we do a phase analysis and we mark the bubble charts. So, you know, I know that a lot of you out there might not get this or really even care but it's a great technology for uh, deciphering problems. And if we don't do it, we're, we're kind of lost. This is, these are the phase rules. So there's six different rules we're looking for unbalanced eccentricity. We're looking for overhung rotor unbalance. We're looking for bent shaft, misalignment across the coupling, cock bearings, and soft foot conditions or mechanical looseness type A. Okay, we're looking for all of these. Anything with a phase icon in it, that's what, what we'll be, be able to distinguish. Okay, last thing, uh, we're gonna look at bearing defect frequencies in the velocity spectrum. Um, we're gonna look at ultrasonic impact and friction, and then the, the five failure stages for rolling element bearings. So this is the high frequency technology uh, that we haven't really talked about yet. Okay, so far we've been focusing on just uh, velocity measurements, overall velocity for uh, trending purposes. This is another trending program that we can look at. Within the same accelerometer, doesn't require any new uh, technology, same time waveform coming out as we use for the lower frequency stuff. We're just filtering it differently. So it's all software. Should be transparent to you, the user. Okay, uh, cage of fundamental train frequency. Uh, always occurs subsynchronous. I have statistics here from 18,000 rolling element bearings. The average uh, cage frequency is 0.428. It ranges from 0.4 times running speed to 0.46. So there's a little uh, bell curve under there, and this is where it shows up. So my synchronous or one times frequencies here, it's below run, running speed, a little less than half of running speed is typically where it shows up. My example at 749, uh, uh, I divide it by running speed, I get 0.42. So I'm within that range, right? Oops, where am I? 0.4, yeah, 0.4 to 0.46. So chances are that's a cage frequency that's showing up in my spectrum. Uh, ball spin frequency, its average is 3.88 times running speed and the range is 1.9 to 5.9 times running speed. So it's a lower frequency range here. My example, I see a peak and it's at 0.5441 times running speed, or excuse me, CPM. I divide it by turning speed of the shaft, I get 3.049. Not three times, it's non-synchronous, 3.049. Okay, so very likely a bearing defect. Uh, my next example is ball pass frequency outer. 
it's a fault on the outer race and the balls are exciting every time they hit it. Its average is 7.757 times running speed. The range is 4.2 to 11.3. So this one's out here at 14,619. Not sure what it is. I put my cursor on it, get that number. I divide it by running speed and I get 8.194. It's non-synchronous. Chances are it's a, well, it can either be an outer race or a inner race. Uh-oh. Sorry, folks. For some reason, there we go. I think I took care of it. My computer got unplugged. Excuse me, technical difficulties. Um, so 8.149, it could be either an outer race or an inner race. Okay. We're not sure, but it's in the range of both. Uh, the, you know, the last couple here, uh, I have a peak at 17,563. So you know the drill, you divide it by running speed, 9.845. I got another peak, 35,127. I don't know what the source of this is. I divide by running speed and it's 19.69. It's also non-synchronous, but it's twice, exactly twice the first one. So this is the fundamental bearing defect. This is the um, harmonic of that. So the exact multiple of that, okay. Uh, what is it uh, as far as uh, the range? It is either an outer race or an inner race. We don't know for sure, okay. Here we have something unusual happening. This is some modulation, okay. I have a center frequency and I have equally spaced sidebands, okay. So I try to find the center, 20,516 and I divide it by running speed, I get 11 and a half. Do the same thing for each of these other peaks, and I get uh, 10 and a half, nine and a half. So they're separated by one times RPM. This is typical of an inner race berry defect. It's a non-synchronous frequency, it's in the right range, and it modulates one times RPM because it's going in and out of the load zone every revolution. So if this uh, bearing is vertical, down in the lower part of the bearing, it, take, it gets more load than when it does at the top, and that pattern repeats every revolution. You'll get a, a, a modulation at one times RPM, and it shows up as sidebands spaced at one times RPM. Okay, so there's bearing defects. We know how to identify them. If we don't know what the bearings are, we know how they present themselves. They're always non-synchronous. They always should be in a certain range. Um, if we want to know if it's coming from the inner race or the outer race of the ball or the, the cage, we can uh, kind of figure it out. Uh, but it, there's a better training method uh, that we'll, we'll see before we'll ever see anything in the velocity spectrum. This is uh, ultrasonic demodulation. Okay, so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at that, and then we're going to look at the failure stages of bearings. This is something called, the whole thing is called demodulation. So what it's doing is it's filtering the time waveform that we would normally collect, and we're looking for high frequency impacting. Okay, and we'll walk through the seven or eight steps real quick and see what's going on. Uh, I've got about eight minutes left. We pull, pull the, the, the same time waveform, goes into our uh, an analysis tool, and we do a little software magic to, to filter it and change it. So the, the raw signal has all the residual imbalance, looseness, misalignment, electrical, hydraulic, varying defects, gear meshing. It has everything in it. Okay? We don't care about the big wiggles. We're looking for the real high frequency stuff that's riding on top of it. Okay? So we have to put it through a filter. Uh, typically, it's a high pass filter or a band pass filter. I believe the, the new Grace uh, transducers have the capability of making one of the transducers a high frequency or a much higher frequency. It goes from a thousand hertz up to I think 8,000 hertz. So we'll be able to capture much higher frequency events. So if we put this through a high pass or band pass filter, we eliminate the low frequency wiggles in it and we only get the high frequency stuff riding on top. Okay. If we zoom in on that, we'll see a couple of things. We'll see a pulsing event. So every time a ball hits that fault in the raceway, bing, and it rings down, bing, bing, bing. So there's a certain rate. The impact rate is very important. 
We could also really zoom in and see what the ring down pattern is. So we could see that it's a natural frequency, typically, that you're ringing the housing structure or something. Um, but we don't really care about the ringing part. We care about how often did we ring the bell. That's telling us what the hammer is. The hammer is the ball hitting that fault in the raceway and then hitting it, the next ball hitting it and the next ball and the next ball. It will be a prescribed rate. We'll be able to decipher what the source is. Okay. We get these transients or this string of transients and it's very low amplitude and it's they're all spaced out in time. So we have to zoom in on them. We can put it through uh, some type of software uh, peak detection uh, something called rectification, where we can uh, eliminate or, or multiply it so it looks like a bigger peak. Um, and there's another thing called time constant enveloping, which is the blue line right here. So we're drawing an outline of the pulsing of that. What we really care about is that peak event. Okay. So each vendor uh, has proprietary signal processing to do just this. Um, and this would be something that uh, Grace would develop uh, in the coming months. Um, we'll put it through a low pass filter now. The low pass filter eliminates the high frequency um, events in there. And like I just mentioned, we don't care about the ringing. We care about how often we run the bell. The curve, the blue curve down below is the outline of that pulse rate. And it's more, it's called a sawtooth uh, profile. This we can trend. So we put it through a peak detector and we can trend the level that's coming out of this. And I made it look pretty variable, but it, or pretty um, clean, but it can be jagged and different. So we're, we'll trend this over time. And when it goes into alarm, there's two possible things it could be. It could be either impacting due to a defect in the raceway, or it could be friction from lack of lubrication. So either way, we probably give it a shot of grease and see if it settles down. Um, and that works quite a bit. But there is if it comes back, there is some type of damage uh, starting in the raceway. Very early indication. This isn't where you change the bearing. This is where you maybe step up the trending a little bit. These are the two things that you'd see in the spectrum. So you can do a spectrum of that um, of that sawtooth waveform. And if there's, if there's no sawtooth peak in there, there's just noise floor, random noise, you'll see something like that. So every survey, this will go up and down a little bit. We can trend the overall level of that uh, energy. If it is a discrete peak due to a um, piece of raceway coming out, little chunk of uh, metal uh, being separated, uh, you'll see a discrete peak show up, a discrete impact in a whole string of harmonics. So you should be able to identify the source. This should be non-synchronous and it should equate to an inner race or outer race uh, defect frequency. And last, uh, the five failure stages of bearing, we've got two minutes left. Um, new bearing, you're gonna have, it's stage zero. A lot of people don't even know this exists. It's a new bearing break-in period. You have machining marks on your uh, raceway that you're trying to get rid of. Uh, if you do a spectrum, a velocity spectrum, a normal spectrum, you won't see any bearing defects. If you do an ultrasonic uh, spectrum, you'll see just random noise floor. All you're doing is breaking off the, the, the little peaks, the little uh, errors in machining um, and smoothing out the raceway actually. Uh, stage one, early micro level subsurface faults or lubrication issues. Um, you're going to get no response in the velocity spectrum and you're just going to get random noise floor. So we're just starting to wear the bearing and very subtle. You won't probably won't even see it. Stage two, you ongoing micro level subsurface faults or lubrication issues. Um, lubrication issues with just random noise. We can address that with, with a little grease. Subsurface faults, that just means that uh, we won't be able to see them on the raceway. They'll be below the raceway. There'll be cracks in the metal uh, lattice structure. Uh, three, micro, uh, macro level, visible surface damage. Evidence appears in the ultrasonic spectrum and the velocity spectrum. So stage three is where we start seeing defects in the velocity spectrum, 
defects in the ultrasonic spectrum. This was a low, um, a fracture below the raceway surface, and it pits out when it uh, loses all the contact there. So they're deep edges is what you're looking for. This is a, a serious defect. So the bearings uh, got a finite lifetime left. Stage four, pronounced visual damage, visual spectrum defect harmonics and sideband modulation. It just goes to pot. So this was a, a, a bearing in a nuclear vertical pump in a nuclear plant. Um, and they asked me to take a look at it. It had all kinds of varying frequencies, non-synchronous peaks in the velocity spectrum. Notice they're not very big, but there's a lot of them. And in the, in the demodulated spectrum, the ultrasonic spectrum, there's peaks and sidebands on the peaks, which is unusual. So they were deg degrading extremely fast. And when they pulled it out, there's debris all over the inside of the bearing casing. Pretty, pretty uh, bad fault, very close to failure. All right. Uh, I think that's it for this time. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming out for these uh, webinars. Um, it's great information. If you're interested in training, I, I do a lot of that and I can do it live or I can do it um, through webinars or I can do it uh, online at your own pace. doesn't matter to me. Um, 